the requested tape. Now, Book TV looks at Plato's Republic. First, part one of an interview with author and Boston University philosophy professor Stanley Rosen. Then we'll watch a book group discussion of the Republic. We'll return to part two of Professor Rosen's interview, where he comments on the group discussion and expands on Greek life and Plato's works. This complete program lasts two hours and 20 minutes. Professor Stan Rosen of Boston University, who was Plato? Plato was the student of Socrates. Uh, more precisely, he's usually regarded as the founder of the history of philosophy in its more formal sense. In other words, there were a number of figures called wise men or even uh, uh, philosophers who lived before Plato, but he's the first person to have uh, created a substantial body of work, of philosophical work, and is uh, regarded as the kind of fountainhead of the Western philosophical tradition. When did he live? Well, he lived uh, in the 5th and 4th centuries B.C. He was born in uh, 428 and died in something like 348. So he, in other words, uh, encompassed uh, the, uh, the Peloponnesian War and the uh, loss of the Athenian Empire, the glory and the decay of classical Greece, you could say. Plato's life spanned that period. I should go back and ask you, based on your first answer, who was Socrates? Socrates was Plato's teacher. Socrates was uh, a, a very uh, extraordinary man who never wrote anything. Uh, he was famous for uh, uh, asking people embarrassing questions such as what is truth, or what is the good life, or why did you do what you did when you took your father to court for impiety, or something of that sort. Socrates, uh, in other words, trained uh, a group of people of whom the most famous was Plato. He did that largely, or almost entirely, as far as we know, orally, simply by conversation with them. Hence the uh, famous Socratic method of asking questions and uh, uh, carrying on philosophy in a dialogue form, rather than delivering formal lectures. What would they have been like back in Athens uh, in, in, what, 2,500 years ago? What would have, how important would they have been in that community? People like Socrates and Plato? Yes. Well, uh, you know, that's an extremely interesting question. Socrates, we, we revere Socrates today as a great philosopher and, a, as Plato said, the justest man of his day. Socrates' reputation was not that good in Athens. He was associated... Uh, with troublemakers because he went around asking embarrassing questions like what is the nature of uh, the divine? Uh, do the gods actually do and say the things that our great uh, poet theologians like Homer and Hesiod have said that they say? In other words, Socrates was perceived by the average Athenian as a kind of eccentric who represented a danger to the stability of the state. And many of the uh, people with whom Socrates spoke were sons, young sons, of the wealthiest and politically most prominent families. And by engaging these young kids in conversation about such fundamental questions as what is justice, Socrates was implicitly committing treason. Because obviously the official answer to the question what is justice is whatever the Athenian laws say it is. So Socrates was considered a, a rather difficult person and finally, through a series of circumstances that it would take too long to summarize at the moment, was put to death by the city. Plato was in a slightly different position. He was very rich, belonged to a, a very prominent family, had a great political career ahead of him, which he uh, entered into briefly at, at, at quite a young age, and then dropped out of, and devoted the rest of his life uh, to philosophical research. He also founded the first, uh, as we would call it today, university, Plato's Academy. So he, he was a man who, uh, who had the opportunity to go into politics, and who uh, tried it and turned it down and devoted himself to teaching and writing his famous dialogues and training his students who carried on the tradition uh, at Plato's Academy, or as, as we would say, university. In a few minutes, we're going to show a discussion uh, of about 12 people sitting around a table yeah. at uh, Politics and Prose Bookstore here in Northwest Washington, and it's called the Classics Book Group, and they do this uh, every first Tuesday of each month. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it, we've had it on tape since uh, June and July. Uh, it's interesting to watch just the average person. I don't know that they want to be called the average person sitting around talking about Plato and Socrates and all of this that you're talking about. How long have you taught this subject? Approximately 43 years. 43 years. 
Now, how, are the kids in the, over the years in your classes uh, there because they choose to be, or is it, an elect, is it a uh, requirement at either Penn State, where you were for 38 years, or at Boston University, where you've been for five? Well, of course, my classes are of two kinds, undergraduate and graduate. The graduate courses are those in which I train people who wish to become professors of philosophy or professional philosophers in some way. The attendance there is all voluntary. The undergraduate courses are mixed. Uh, I, uh, one course I teach is uh, an undergraduate introductory course with 185 students. And uh, it's hard to give you a general statement, uh, but most of them are there because they want to be. In other words, it's true that they'll have to take an elective course in humanities, but it could have been in something else. So philosophy courses tend to be self-selecting, in other words. Uh, you tend to see a better, better group of students. Well, you know that this is not the easiest subject to, uh, to talk about, especially if you're just kind of on the periphery. And I guess what I'm leading up to is, when do you see students really kind of kick in and start to uh, enjoy this subject, and, and how do they get there? What do you do to, to right. interest them? Right. That's a very important question. Obviously, I've devoted my life to thinking about it. I think the most important thing that, that I would uh, uh, say is it is necessary to show students that philosophical questions emerge directly from their everyday life. In other words, if one presents a kind of technical uh, series of lectures using very fancy terminology and talking about extremely abstract topics like the one and the many, the nature of being, the relationship between being and non-being, and so on and so forth. Or even if one begins by saying that, well, philosophy is about the structure of knowledge, and in particular scientific knowledge, and we have to learn how to deal with concepts and logical systems. That's fine for graduate students, but it doesn't work with the uh, undergraduate who's there to fulfill a humanities requirement. On the other hand, if you can show these kids that the things that they are deeply concerned about, like what, the, what should they do with their lives? What is a correct moral code? How do they stand with respect to their religion? Uh, that kind of thing. If you can do that in language that they speak, not in professional jargon, then it's really quite uh, astounding how uh, the, f the fires of philosophy begin to burn in their souls. But it's got to be done in that kind of semi-colloquial way. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Why do you think Socrates and Plato have survived all these years? Well, one part of the uh, answer is this. Plato was perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to state this in an unqualified way, but I think most, many, or perhaps even most of my colleagues would agree with me. Plato was the greatest artist and writer, in the sense of uh, master of prose, of all the philosophical, of all the members of the Western philosophical tradition. Most philosophers can't write very well, I mean, by literary standards. You know, it's no fun reading Hegel or Leibniz or Immanuel Kant among the moderns. Aristotle uh, depends what you're reading, but it, many of his writings are extremely technical. Plato, of course, wrote some very technical dialogues, but on the whole, reading Plato is comparable to reading Shakespeare or uh, Dante or, let us say, uh, one of the great Greek tragedians. Now, I don't mean to imply that there are no substantive differences between the Platonic dialogues and these works of art, but the central answer to your question is that Plato was a great, great poet, a great artist. Okay, this is uh, not related so much to poetry as it is to everyday use of language here now in the 20th century, or soon to be the 21st century. When someone says they have a platonic relationship with another person, right. where does that phrase come from? Uh, it comes, of course, from uh, uh, Plato's interpretation of the human soul as erotic, as marked by eros, which means literally sexual love or, or passion. But the platonic presentation of the doctrine of Eros in the dialogue, the Symposium, uh, represents the differences in types of human beings as uh, in terms of the degree to which their erotic appetite moves upward from the body through to beautiful works of art, to uh, productions of uh, science, and uh, finally culminates in pure, in the, in the vision of the pure so-called platonic ideas what we could call the eternal forms that constitute the structure of intelligibility of the world. A platonic relationship, then, is one in which the physical eros, the sexual eros, has been transformed. As Freud would have said, who was not uninfluenced by all of this, sublimated. In other words, the sexual eros must be sublimated to love of the soul, and the love of the soul must in turn be sublimated 
and to love of the objects of the soul, namely the eternal beings or forms that he called ideas. So if someone has a platonic relationship, we think it means non-sexual? That's that correct. That's correct. There can be, a, a, and, a, and certainly would be, a component of sexual uh, desire in this. From Plato's standpoint, all human relationships uh, contain an erotic element. I, I don't want to, again, uh, oversimplify, but there, there are certain similarities between Freud and Plato. The great difference uh, is this. Freud explains the highest human appetites or human desires in terms of the lowest. In other words, he starts from, uh, starts from the bottom, or, or, or differently stated, says, well, the reason why we have friends or the reason why we go into a certain occupation or uh, the reason why we have uh, certain political or moral views can be explained in terms of lower desires which have been hidden from us by rationalizations. Plato does it in the reverse order. He says, if you want to understand, if you want to understand sexual love or friendship, you have to understand it as a corporeal, a bodily manifestation of the eros of the human spirit, which, when purified of the physical love, rises to uh, the non-physical, uh, what we would call spiritual or intellectual. So that, that's, the, uh, uh, that's correct. In other words, a platonic relationship would not be a, a fundamentally sexual one. But let's not forget that there is a sexual component in all human relations from Plato's standpoint. Professor Rosen was born in Warren, Ohio, and he is in Boston, as we are talking here on this program, for 43 years, has been a professor of philosophy and poetry. And um, we're going to talk more with him um, after this discussion is over. But before we do there, just a couple quick questions. What was the difference in age between Socrates and Plato? Uh, one generation, approximately. About, about uh, 28 years. When they killed Socrates, how old was he? 71. And how long did Plato live? Plato lived uh, uh, approximately 80 years. And when Plato was a student of Socrates, uh, at what time in their lives was this? In other uh, words, was Plato just know, a kid? Or? No, 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 no. He would, I would say he was approximately, uh, you know, it's hard to, these things are not known with precision, incidentally. But he was probably in his 20s. He was probably in his 20s. Now, and he saw Socrates put to death, of course. And where was he put to death? Uh, in the city of Athens. Right down there below the Acropolis? Was That's it that? right, yeah. He took the hemlock in the prison cell. They accused him, the Athenians accused Socrates of uh, corrupting the young, and of not believing in the gods in which the city of Athens believed, and then bringing in new gods. And how important was Athens uh, in, in those days? Athens was, uh, one could say, the peak of, uh, <laughs> I was going to say Western civilization, but it was the, it was at, it was, it was the most uh, magnificent uh, of the political uh, entities of the 5th and 4th centuries BC. It wasn't the largest. The Persian Empire was, of course, much bigger. But uh, Athens was the most important of the Greek cities and was the center of philosophy, science, art, the techni, the, the arts and crafts, and was also a great political power. We're talking about the period, in other words, uh, just before uh, uh, Socrates, the period dominated by uh, Pericles, the great statesman. And Athens was at war with, uh, with Sparta, but the war was actually a much larger phenomenon. It was a, an attempt by the Athenians to maintain dominance over the uh, Mediterranean world, at least uh, up until the point where the uh, Persian Empire took over. So Athens was extremely important. I was, I'm tempted to say that uh, from an intellectual standpoint, Athens was a kind of synthesis of Manhattan and Washington. In other words, it was the center of, of artistic and, and intellectual and literary life, but also the center of political intriguing and power and the desire for the uh, uh, intensification of uh, uh, the, ex the extension of the, Ameri of the Athenian uh, Republic. I, I started to stammer when I said that because I don't, want to, I don't want to condemn American foreign policy as being simply imperialistic. But I was thinking of the extraordinary political uh, interests in Washington, uh, off which often don't extend beyond the Beltway, you know, to most Americans. And uh, similarly, the, uh, the extraordinary uh, intellectual and artistic activity in, uh, uh, in uh, New York. So you could think of Athens as a kind of combination of, of Manhattan and Washington. In, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to go to the Politics and Prose Bookstore. And, and show you, this is actually uh, an interesting experiment on our part at C-SPAN. Richard Hall is a one-man band producer and photographer for this program. You'll, he, he edited it. He did the whole, he conceived it.
he um, he brought us Professor Rosen, uh, and and you'll notice in this program all throughout it this discussion that you can see from time to time Richard off to the right. And it's just a small little detail that 2,500 years after Plato and Socrates, that uh, we're able to do this kind of communications with one human being. Uh, I want to ask you just a couple of quick questions that will directly relate to this conversation. When you see people sitting around talking, and there are people that range in age probably from their mid-20s to uh, their 70s or 80s in this discussion group, right? Would, do people know what they're talking about when they <laughs> attempt uh, to talk about Plato's Republic? I knew you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer you honestly. Uh, I was quite struck by the range of the answers. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised because I've been in this business for a long time. Nevertheless, each time you see it, it's striking. Some of the questions that were put, I think, were, were naive but extremely to the point. Let me give you a quick example. One person in the club said, I wouldn't want to live in that city. Now, that's exactly right. If we had a lot more time to talk, I could tell you in detail why it was not Plato's intention to describe a city in which anybody would want to live. The purpose of the Republic is to show what price has to be paid in order to achieve justice. But that's a very complicated and subtle thing. What was or what is Plato's Republic? What is the document? The document, uh, it's a, a, a dialogue uh, that uh, the manuscript tradition goes back to the 8th century, you know. We don't have the original papyri, uh, but we do have a pretty good tradition going back to the 8th century. Uh, the, the Republic is a dialogue in 10 books uh, in which Socrates goes down to the Piraeus, which is the harbor of the city of Athens, with a friend of his who happens to be Plato's brother. They meet a group of people, all of whom are dramatically quite interesting, but we don't have time to identify them. And they spend about three or four hours, or perhaps six hours even, talking about the following question. Which, is, which leads to happiness for the individual person, the life of justice or the life of injustice? And in order to settle that issue, or at least to explore it, they transfer the question to the uh, to the, uh, the, the domain of politics. Socrates makes an analogy between the soul of the individual person and the city. And he claims in a, in a famous sentence that the city is the soul writ large. And then they spend a number of books investigating a just city and what would be necessary to make a just city. And then they come back and try to apply the results of this to the individual soul. That's the basic theme of the Republic. You can't see this, but I'm holding up Alan Bloom's version of the Republic of Plato just to show how oh, big yeah. it is. Yeah. And uh, the ten books that you're talking about are within the covers of this book. Right. Uh, which is, do you have any idea how many words it is or, or give some, it's just, a, it would look like a standard book you could buy in a bookstore. It would contain all ten books. It would be about, uh, depending on the translation, of, I would say about 400 pages. Approximately 400 pages. You and I are going to come back and talk a lot more about Plato and Socrates and all this after this is over. Uh, as we said earlier, this was recorded back in June and July. There are a couple of discussions. Yeah. Uh, you're going to see at this point a 90-minute discussion of um, 12 people who meet the first Tuesday of each month at Politics and Prose Bookstore uh, here at uh, out in the Northwest Washington. And the subject is uh, Plato's Republic. Our guest that you've seen up till now is Professor Stanley Rosen. He is in Boston as we're talking today. He's from Warren, Ohio, as we said, but has been a teacher for 43 years of philosophy. Professor Rosen, we'll look forward to talking with you after we watch this discussion group on Plato's Republic. Thank you very much. Book TV recently visited the Classics Book Group at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. This book discussion group meets on the first Tuesday of each month and in June and July of this year devoted two sessions to Plato's Republic. After the 90-minute discussion, we'll continue our interview with Stanley Rosen. The, I think that the Republic is interesting um, because, you know, the first question that, that comes to mind, uh, for me anyway, um, and I, I want to find out what comes to mind for other folks, but for me it is, you know, what is it about? What, um, what, what's the Republic about? Uh, it, it's it's um, uh, Plato kind of claims that it's about uh, justice and injustice and the uh, existence of justice and injustice and, and what it might mean to live a just life or, or uh, an, an unjust life, an unjust life, um, but uh, that's couched in a political fable of, uh, of what a perfect, just city might be. And when we refer to the Republic, 
uh, sort of in common currency, certainly it's that aspect which is at the fore, its description of political life rather than its description of the life of individuals. Um, but there's also a huge amount in here. Uh, somebody said, I think you said uh, just before that you were getting a little sick of everybody agreeing with Socrates all the time. <laughs> Um, and there's, there is a huge amount uh, in the Republic uh, in defense of uh, the Socratic method, the, dial, the, the dialectical method. Um, it comes up again and again from the beginning to the end of the Republic. Uh, so another possibility is that, it's, that, that that's one of the things that it's about, the, the Socratic method itself, the dialectical method itself. Um, it's, it's also um, about that, that great, uh, you know, the... the <laughs> the uh, platonic ideal of platonic ideals, which is um, the, the existence of perfect forms out there that re reality corresponds to. Um, that, that also comes up throughout the book. So, you know, what did people think of the first, the first section here? What, uh, what did you, you know, do, do, do you take, I guess the, the, the question is, do you take Plato uh, at his word that this is a, a, a book that's about justice and injustice. I think it is, but I don't think he really, when he starts talking about it, I wasn't sure what he was talking about or how he, defi how he defined justice and injustice, because they keep going around to all the different ways, justice, injust, and just, justice, injustice, just, and justice, just. I mean, they turn the arguments over and over and don't end up anywhere. And that, of course, is when he starts trying to say, okay, maybe we can't talk about this as it applies to the individual. Maybe we have to talk about it as it applies to the group. And that's when he starts postulating this city and the pe people who would be in it. And I had a little trouble with some of that because it's very constrained. Now, maybe that's just the philosophy. It's extremely simple. Each person only has one function in the city. And he moves on from there to start defining education as in very constrained ways. And frankly, I sounded, it sounded to me like a pretty dull place as far as I got in this, in this reading of it. That's not a place I'd want to be, to live uh, under those kinds of constraints in order to supposedly achieve justice. It, uh, it didn't appeal to me. It's a place where I wanted to be. Yeah. I, I was very interested in the, the book one, uh, the this as a response to the to Thrasymachus, Thrasymachus, is that view, which is certainly very much with us still. That that what that might makes right, and that the strong mm -hmm. uh, say what is right, and and that's all that counts. And I think that certainly, apparently, that was a, a common view, uh, although there was some dissent about it in Athens, and there's and it's still a common view. And it permeates our society, and it permeates the international situation. Mm -hmm. uh, one can look at the situation in, in the Balkans and say that here's an example of someone trying to, to apply justice. Or you can look at it and say, well, the, the, the court in The Hague was simply responding to the, to the powerful. Uh, and it seems to me that I did not get terribly far I got halfway into book three, so I haven't really got the whole picture of how he deals with it as a society. But I think my impression is that what he's trying to do is to find some answer to the idea that the only thing that matters is who the strongest is. And that certainly that is a commendable attempt to try to find an answer to that. I haven't read it far enough to know whether his answer works or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm focused more on that than on the society. So, sort of going along the same the same line. I, I'm unfortunately I'm not very far into it, but I, you know, from a long time ago, I do remember reading Plato in earlier incarnations and many years ago. But um, one of the questions that that came to my mind in reading it was uh, the question of what was the political context in in Athens at the time that Plato is, is, is writing this because he, um, he is um, postulating a kind of a republic that is not, not the Athenian uh, model uh, and he must have found in the democracy of the golden age or whatever it is, he must have found some something very much missing. Of course, we've seen some of that earlier in the Apology and in mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and, uh, in, in, in Socrates uh, earlier in the earlier dialogues but it's very curious to me how he how he runs this into into the Republic that that will be coming up in, in, in terms of a, I think as you said a pretty sterile and and uh, uh, rigid society mm -hmm. that seems quite at odds with our notions of classical uh, Athenian uh, democratic flowering, mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder what it was in the history of of Athens that led him to be so disillusioned. I almost wish we had read this before we read the Apology and the Crito and all of that about the death of Socrates, because when you read some of this, you begin to understand why the rest of the Athenians were terribly sympathetic to his mm -hmm. point of view, because as I understand it, and I'm not no authority on Greek history, but they, they had a pretty freewheeling democracy in which everybody participated, no matter what your role in society yeah. was. And it sounds as if uh, you have, what is who, I, I, no, it, I did have depend, it did depend on what your role in society yeah. was. There was not everybody well, was. Well, the slaves. Were well, if you were, if well, as long women, as you were a citizen, slaves, if, as long as you were a other people right. too. There was citizenship was uh, but, rather narrowly. But defined. as long as you were, you know, free white and twenty-one, mm -hmm. as they say, uh, you Carolina did participate in a society, whether you were a farmer or a plumber, or whether you were a high-ranking individual or a soldier. Everybody took part in this mm -hmm. great democracy that they had, and it and must have been pretty unruly. I mean, when you look at what the house what the house does with its 500 and some members, and you can just contemplate what uh, what a debate in Athenian society must have been like. And maybe it was just it was too unruly for Socrates to uh, to contemplate because he never really much participated in it himself. If we believe what I. F. Stone has to say about the trial of Socrates. So that um, but that brings up a good point too, as do you, which is that we tend to think of Greece as of Athens rather as the uh, the the bed of democracy, um, and and in that sense uh, we look to it very much as the the sort of root of Western civilization politically, um, and yet uh, here is this very important uh, dialogue by a very important um, Greek philosopher who that's arguing not at all for democracy. Oh, no, 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 no. I disagree with you. you disagree? I don't think he's arguing against democracy. It's how it's going to work. He doesn't like the forum. He has trouble with the forum it's okay. in at this particular at the time he's writing. Mm -hmm. It's unwieldy. And I think he wants uh, somehow for there to be more control of who rises up to the top. And I want to in this translation in the translator's introduction on 16, it says, this in a few words is the theme of the Republic. Quote, I was forced in fact to the belief that the only hope of finding justice for society or for the individual lay in true philosophy, and that mankind will have no respite from trouble until either philosophers gain political power or politicians become by some miracle true <laughs> philosophers, unquote. And that's where the justice comes in, mm -hmm. not for justice is the top, but that the person or the people who are going to rise to the top and lead, mm -hmm. to be in charge of the democracy, or whatever you want to call it, are good people who understand justice, mm -hmm. whose ever description of justice. Mm -hmm. Now, but is that... Um, well, let's. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I agree with you. Uh, I'm not sure that 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 constitutes democracy, for one thing. Oh, I um, no, uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't who, think I was saying that. But that's oh, right. okay. Uh, but well, then, then then let me let me bring it to another question because uh, to to constrain it to the books that are here, um, what the, the, that we know that people read. What place does uh, censorship have in a democracy? Because it, it struck me that it struck me that um, I was really surprised. I've got to say, I, I had read Plato before, but I hadn't read The Republic before. Um, I had had avoided it, and I've got to say that when I got to Book Two, which is very early um, <laughs> in the ten books, and uh, and he started talking about. 
uh, the first thing that we need to do in our just city, after figuring out how many people are going to be there, which is not really... And what professions they And what represent. professions they're, they're going to represent, is uh, censor what people hear. Yeah. And then it's two books worth. It's two books, really, of, of censorship. I'm looking at uh, 377A. Do you, is that... Yeah. How you, I mean, do, do, is that... Yeah, that, that helps. Which, which book is going to... What book is it in? Uh, it's in book two, 377A, um, and uh, and he, um, w well, it's, it's there that he begins to talk, and, and in C he says, we must begin then, it seems, by a censorship over our story makers, and what they do well we must pass, and what not, reject. Uh, and the stories on the accepted list we will induce nurses and mothers to tell to the children and so shape their souls by these stories far rather than their bodies by their hands. Uh, and, but most of the stories they now tell we must reject. He, then he but, proceeds to throw out Homer and everybody. I mean, it's, well, it's, but, there's not a whole lot left when he gets done. Yeah, yeah but I mean, that can be read on, on sort of on two levels. I mean, he, obviously he does take it to, for us to an extreme of, of censorship and to the modern uh, temper that's 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 not right but on the other hand what he is doing is criticizing um, criticizing the uh, uh, the media of the day mm -hmm. saying that's right. uh, saying that that there's some real problems with 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 uh, with Homer and I, I think that we found that pretty well ourselves in, in, in but he also yeah, doesn't seem to understand something very fundamental, and that is that humans won't be good just because you they deal only with good things. No, that's true. That there is this this thread of people that has got a badness to it, that people do like these well, he things. He does deal with that later on. That okay. Does, does he ever really come to grips with this this constant um, tension in, 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 in the Greek literature? The, the Dionysian and the and and the Apollonian. I mean the, which which the the dramatists and everybody else has always really stressed this. I mean there is the irrational. Book nine, imperfect okay. societies. <laughs> okay, well I look forward to <laughs> well, book nine because <laughs> because he is so superbly rational and uh, at least up to, up to the end of book two, which is all the further I am now. And, and my recollection of it, it's very women. rational I, I, and I, and totally I, misses this this uh, this other streak in human nature, which all all the you know the 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 tragedians and the. Uh, and the myth makers and everybody else. He seems but, to think that through censorship he can eliminate it. Yeah. But, but are we talking about, you are being too are we optimistic. Talking about today besides yeah. Yeah, uh, we want to censor stop today. pumping violence into yeah. our kids' minds. Some people exactly. are talking about that. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I think you're much too optimistic that the modern temper is against censorship. Yeah. I mean, I think well, I, I, I mean, and it yeah. runs right in this country right through the 20th century. century. Well, uh, that, I think it's an uh, issue. Rotten stuff to yeah. it's, it's an issue. It's a it's a yeah. genuine issue today as much as it was yeah. then. Sure. I don't think we are all of one he, mind. He casts it in pretty strong no, terms. Well, I would like to suggest that maybe. And I, I haven't gotten far enough to say this, but that this may be a critique of Athenian democracy and not really intended to, because it's clear if they can, anyone ever constructed a society like this, it would either be sterile or it would fall apart in a day. But, but he is raising issues about Athenian democracy at the time which are very valid issues about any democracy. Mm -hmm. And when we came to form a democracy in this country, we didn't create an Athenian democracy. We created a democracy with ch or a republic, republic with checks and balances, with a Senate, which is not democratic, and a, a system of electing the president, which is not democratic. The House is the only really democratic element in our government, and it's not the best part of the government, yeah. frankly. So I don't think the Athenian courts. democracy is our model. The role of the judges. See, then the maybe, yeah. maybe our founding fathers read Plato and looked at this and said, okay, maybe what we need to do is break up this power that, that uh, Socrates wanted to vest in this one individual mm -hmm. and yeah. let these various lo loci of power balance each other out. And I, that, that's, of course, what kind of a system they set up. Mm -hmm. Whether it works better than the Republic or not, of course, anybody can argue. It survived. But it has survived. <laughs> that's right. So far. <laughs> So this far. is not very old. That's right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm not sure that its survival this, yeah. is dependent on the more democratic elements. It may be dependent on the, more, on the less democratic elements. Well, this seems but. like a description <laughs> of a perfect society um, thought up by somebody who's comfortable more in his head than in reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the censorship idea came from, that 
I'll think up what's really great and then we'll get people to do it instead of looking at what people do and think, thinking how can we work with that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think later he contradicts that when he talks about poetry. I, I know we're probably not going to talk about that tonight, but he said poetry is inferior because it only describes it's not reality. But I think here he's putting more emphasis on the idea than on reality. Um, the, uh, my question about censorship is not to, uh, is not meant to suggest that we don't have our own issues with censorship, but, um, it strikes me that this is the beginning of his description of the perfect state, mm -hmm. um, and in many ways, uh, well, he identifies it as such. He says, we must begin then with censorship. And in many ways, I, I, I think he's beginning then with censorship. I, I want to know where it says, where he says that. Okay, Specifically I where he says we must begin with censorship. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a part in, in here at the beginning that says that we have to understand, it's in the introduction, that we have to understand that the, there was no formal education in, in Greece at the time, in Athens. Well, that makes mm -hmm. a big difference. And so what he's doing is starting formal education and saying, mm -hmm we need to educate people in order for them to rise to this position of uh, responsibility and yes. in order for them to know to be able to be discerning people and do what is just and good for the whole they need to know certain things now you, you want to read that as censorship but i'd be curious as to I mean, see, I, I see it from that side, and yes, he does talk about, you know, this is terrible and this is bad in here, but as this also says, they didn't have the Bible in. Mm -hmm. But do you remember the part where he said, we have to lie to the people, we have to lie? That mm -hmm. It will be okay for the, for the rulers of this Yeah, but population. I think it ought to be understood in context for what the situation sure. was then at mm -hmm. the time. Sure. With no schooling at all except for um, a, a very certain uh, wealthy, whatever wealth was. I'm then. not sure that's true. Because so when we were reading that. Aristophanes, it's, you know, he talks about Socrates setting up a school to educate yeah, kids. But it's, yeah, but it's who, it's, it's not the street kids. It's a very small, the academy, that this, well, what Socrates was doing was the very beginning, but that's what he was trying to do in the academy. But that's just the very beginning of it, and it's what should be taught in the academy, and that was new. But he talks about education in Greece consisting of the gymnasium and, and music, which he, in which he incorporates all the literature and all the, you know, all of the uh, drama and poetry and all the rest is all incorporated into that. And, and I presume science as much as they had any also. Mm -hmm. um, so it tells me that there was some, it wasn't a school system, but, it was but people did learn it. It was limited. Yeah. But if, if this is to be taken as a curriculum, then it's different from if it's state censorship. And, and I'm not, for people who've gone further with us, is he advocate? I mean, it may be we're presu they, they well, may that, not have been able to conceive I, that's, that's of the sort of know. state Does it really censorship. Say that we're going to start with censorship, yeah. or, or is well, this yes. what we're going to teach? Well, in our maybe it does, is is but I'd a, like to see yeah. how it's how that yeah. appears. Censorship is a very loaded phrase in our society. Yeah. It may not have been but, so but loaded even in if Greece. It's, yeah. He goes through several stories, including stories, I mean, that were well known, stories by Aeschylus, and he has Homer, Iliad, and the Odyssey, he goes through what's wrong with them, and then says, we must therefore put a stop to stories of this kind before they breed in our young men an undue tolerance of wickedness. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. and, and he, an issue I mean, today. And, and, yes, which is an issue, issue today. today. Yes. <laughs> the question is not, I, I agree with you, I agree with you. He is, he, it's, it's important to keep in mind uh, the context and that he is interested in um, establishing something that hasn't been established mm -hmm. before. Um, and, and, and it's also true formally that established. Formally, esta formally establishing something that has not formerly been established. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, and, and I think that's important to keep in mind. It's also important to keep in mind that censorship is a loaded phrase, and, and I threw it out on purpose mm -hmm. as such. Mm -hmm. But the, my question is not, uh, even in context, I think that the question of um, choosing what children can learn uh, is, is a loaded topic. Even when we say, 
uh, that he is establishing, even if we take the best, which is that he's establishing a curriculum, I think it's a loaded topic. He is interested in down to controlling how people talk about the gods mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. attributing to the gods bad qualities. Mm -hmm. Now, that's very different in my mind from, um, from establishing a curriculum of things that it's important for people to know. What he is saying, and, and this gets back uh, to, to something that you said earlier, is that if we can keep them from hearing about the bad stuff, and, and he's defining the bad stuff pretty broadly, then we can keep them from being bad people. On, again, on 377B, uh, he says, um, hold on, yeah, uh, B, he says, shall we then thus lightly suffer our children to listen to any chance stories fashioned by any chance teachers, and so to take into their minds opinions for the most mm -hmm. part contrary to those opinions for the most part contrary to do, to those that we shall think it desirable for them to hold when they grow up um, he's not talking here about knowledge because knowledge comes up later and uh, and he talks very very clearly about the difference between what opinion is and what and what uh, knowledge is and he he recognizes that you're really we're really only talking here about opinion um, and 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 here too he he's saying uh, and, and I guess that's what's at issue for me, is um, is controlling opinion the same as controlling, uh, uh, setting a curriculum? Well, I, I, I no, it, it just seems, I, I mean, it seems to me that we're really getting at the root of, 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 of what this is about, because the underlying assumption of, of a democratic um, form of government is that through discussion, through the inner, the marketplace of ideas, that the the best uh, solution for for the the for the body politic will arise? Now, nobody, uh, you know, the, in in our own jurisprudence, we say that uh, freedom of expression doesn't mean that you can call fire in a in a in a in a crowded theater. So there are limits upon upon free freedom of expression and upon the free free market of, of ideas and and uh, even in our own concept and certainly I mean this is after all the end of the 20th century and and we saw what happened in the Weimar Republic we know that that there are dangers in 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 democracy that it can swing in the wrong directions but I think what is significant in 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 uh, at least what I've read so far in Plato is that he doesn't give any credence to that interplay of ideas. He is not a relativist, and I think that there's a certain amount in the democratic uh, ethos uh, theories that says things are relative, that my opinion is, as we, you just mentioned opinion, my opinion is my opinion, your opinion is your opinion, and may the best opinion uh, after we talk about it win and reach a consensus on what, what would be right opinion. And that's about as far as we go in our modern well, world. But that is, not, no, that is no, not Plato's. Not uh, Plato is, 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 is much more of an absolutist and uh, much more directive. So I think that, that these, these are, it, it's more than just a question of curriculum. I think there's some basic theories of, of, uh, of the body politic here. And talk about what we've learned in the 20th century. We've learned that when uh, only one opinion and who's to decide what it is uh, uh, sways everything and decides uh, what our kids are going to read and everything, uh, we have uh, the Third Reich, we have the Soviet Union. Uh, it, it, to me, it's as, it's as if in a practical application, this is almost a primer for the, for the Third Reich or, mm -hmm. or, or the former Soviet Union. Paul Pot. Right, what yeah. what would we do with a children's book uh, in the school library that held Hitler up as, an, as a model? Wouldn't we ban it? Some I people would, yes. Would we not ban it? Would people feel that that was a legitimate age, exercise? We would probably debate it. We would <laughs> probably debate it. The ACLU would bring us suit. Ultimately, we'd have to come to a decision as to whether to permit it, it in our educational, in our school yeah. system. And I think it would probably not last a book that, had, that, that said Hitler was right. The certain groups of people should be exterminated. I don't think we'd permit that. At least I hope we wouldn't. I think we hope we wouldn't. I think it would depend on what the age group was. If 
third graders, no. no. But if they were yeah. tenth but graders, again, we're talking about a curriculum. Books. Books. I'm talking about children. A, that, that's yeah. kind of a it's, a, it's a very good example mm -hmm. because it points out, too, though, um, that, that Plato is talking about, he's projecting his idea of a perfect state. Mm -hmm. Now, a book that said that Hitler was right, uh, a ch and there are plenty out there, mm -hmm. um, but a children's book that said that Hitler was right um, is not is not envisioning the future. It's it's justifying the past, and we know the evil mm -hmm. of Hitler mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. uh, which is the difference here. Is that he's not he, uh, Plato is and and why it may be more. I mean, of course, I'm excusing our society over Plato's Plato's okay. ideas in the republics, but but it may be more. It, it, it's easier to make those kind. It, it seems to me easier to make those kinds of decisions when. You can say, well, Hitler may have been right, but he, you know, murdered six million, eight million, mm -hmm. and uh, and so instead we we say, you know, you can read this when you grow up, uh, versus saying, well, you know, we know that the gods don't really shift their form into bulls, and therefore we won't um, we won't allow any of those fables mm -hmm. that talk about Zeus shape shifting um, mm -hmm. or Zeus tricking. Well, well, how, how about allowing uh, the issue about teaching creationism as science? Mm -hmm. uh, are we? Are we? Is that? Does that? I mean, do we? Is that something to be debated? Uh, that that in in sixth grade that the world was actually created in seven days, four thousand and some odd years ago? Or are we going to teach that that's? We know that that's not so. I, I think we should teach that we know that that's not so. And if some group wants to go off in church and somewhere and teach mm -hmm. the other version, well, then, that's okay. But you, know, you can teach it historically that people used to think yeah. that. But I don't think we should, in public education, paid for by the taxpayers, teach scientific stuff which is absolute nonsense. Well, there you mm -hmm. have ideas yeah. being presented as science. Mm -hmm. And Plato was presenting ideas as ideas. I was just thinking, I wonder why this lasted so long when I disagree with it so much. It sounds so alien to democracy and the things I believe in. And I think the reason is that I don't even think he was trying to establish anything. And if he had established this, I think we would have seen it as something we didn't want. And we would be talking about it the same way as we do now talk about Hitler. It well, he, he failed when he tried to when he tried to advise a, a state. He what was do you think failure. he was trying to do if he wasn't trying to establish a, a different? I don't think he was trying to uh, to advocate democracy at all. I think he was advocating government by the best, and I never could figure out how those best were to be chosen. And that was something that disturbed me very much as I was reading. We have these guardians. Where are they coming from? Who picked yeah. them? They're these wonderful people. They're going to have all this power. Sounds mm -hmm. great if it works, mm -hmm. and if he had, if it had really been established, we would have found out probably that it worked terribly and it caused much suffering and pain because we didn't have ideal creatures; we had human beings, mm -hmm. and that would have made all the difference. Uh, it seemed to me, um, and I only read chapter two and five, so I'm sort of, <laughs> but it seemed to me like he was taking us through the process of examination of philosophy of government, uh, censorship, if you will. That, and this is a process that you evaluate and think about what this is, not whether it's right or wrong, but how do we arrive at that analysis mm -hmm. of what's going on. That's, that's what I got out of it. I, and I think, I, I said earlier that I think that all through um, this, all through this very long work, um, he is, uh, he is, not just defending his method, but actually arguing for Ew. his method, mm -hmm. and 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 what you're saying, I think, is true. That there is um, that there is an element to this that is um, educational, insofar as it's an ex just an examination of these ideas. Um, on page uh, 336, book one, section three. I I'm not sure what these numbers refer to, but. Mm -hmm. Did, did it say in your... I think yeah, they actually make them universal. I mean, if I can find what you're referring to, yeah. I can find in my book. So, okay, so 336, um, there's a couple of interesting things um, about 336. The first thing um, is that uh, this is where you get uh, Thrasymachus. I, I'm very bad with 
Rasamakis. Rasamakis. Rasamakis sounds good. Rasimicus. Might make, makes right. Rasimicus. Um, uh, <laughs> paragraph C. Um, he he just he he leaps up and he attacks the Socratic method. Mm -hmm. uh, he bawled out into our midst, "What balderdash is this that you have been talking? And why do you simple Simon's truckle and give way to one another?" Um, and Interesting he, translation. He says, you know, Socrates, <laughs> don't merely ask questions or plume yourself upon converting any answer that anyone gives, uh, but, but you yourself give answers. And, and he sort of brings that up. And this whole section, actually, I found fascinating because uh, Socrates responds, and when he responds, he, he says, you know, I was so dismayed that if I hadn't been looking at him right before he spoke, uh, I wouldn't have been able to respond at all. Uh, and, and, and I, when I heard him, was dismayed, and looking upon him was filled with fear. And I believe if I had not looked at him before he did at me, I should have lost my voice. But as it is, at the very moment when he began to be exasperated, I glanced at him first. Um, and, and there's something, uh, what's interesting to me about that is that there's something very personal in that for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that comes through, I think, in these dialogues quite a bit. Um, the, in, in the, the idea of the Socratic method, which is very different than our own idea of education. And to get back to the, the example of a curriculum, um, another way of thinking about the idea of censorship is that Plato isn't just talking, it seems to me, about trying to keep bad ideas away from people, but he's worried that bad people will be transmitting those bad ideas. And, um, and for him, education is something very personal. And even the teacher, even Socrates, you know, has to be looking at the student and has to have that connection. Um, but then the, it continues to be interesting because 337, um, Thrasymachus uh, comes out and says, you know, here we have the well-known irony of Socrates. And we've just had this paragraph, which is the most personal glimpse of Socrates we mm -hmm. get the whole evening. Um, you know, I, 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 I have read the whole thing, and this is the most personal he is, saying that he trembled in fear. He couldn't, he couldn't speak to this guy without looking at him. And then Thrasymachus turns around and says, um, you know, this is irony. He can't be, he can't be telling me the truth. Um, and that, when I went back and, and, you know, it was one of the sections that I had marked. And so when I went back after finishing it and reading it, I thought, you know, what is the relationship of irony? to this whole thing, which, mm -hmm. frankly, I found horrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole of the Republic, I was not on Socrates' side. Uh, everything in me rebelled against what he was talking about. And, you know, then I came back to this passage here, and I thought, you know, well, wait a second, what is the relationship of, of Socrates to irony and of the Republic to irony? Is it all a big send-up? Are we supposed to come out of it? In other words, the question is, are we supposed to come out of this? And, and I, don't, I, mean, I don't know, but are we supposed to come out of this and say, you know, wait a second, wait a second, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. To me, this whole republic is just a vehicle for getting people to think about what things really mean. It's just a vehicle, and I don't know if he believes in it or he cares about it, but it's an example. He said, let's take this. It's like the devil's advocate. He could take either side, I really believe, and, and just start an argument. Mm -hmm. um, the translator's notes say periodically, as you go through this edition, don't take this to heart. Don't take this part too seriously. You know, think what Plato is trying to do here, and don't take it word for word. Mm -hmm. Gives you, I find, lots of caveats in here, mm -hmm. which actually makes it a lot easier to read because you stop being quite so stunned, horrified, and upset, and so on as you go through. And just for the translation you have, they don't use the word irony in here, they use uh, Thrasymachus laughed sarcastically and replied, There you go with your old affectation. Socrates. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Maybe we should be reading this in Greek. Who is Greek? the translator of that? <laughs> Just uh, Lee. Is that right? Desmond Lee? And your translation is, Andrew? Uh, Paul Shorey. Right, it's the Loeb classic, li classical They're really good notes. I, I really, Desmond Lee. Um, it's Penguin Classics mm -hmm. is the one. Um, it, it took a lot of, it, 
I, I never had a philosophy course in any of my lack of schooling. And so this is new ground for me. And I, I found that the notes that go along with this, um, that each chapter book heading has enough of an introduction to give you the core of what it's about. And then as it goes through, it says uh, in various translations, it actually means this, and it has all these connotations to mm -hmm. it. So right. if you're not reading it in Greek, you can see when it says, and you know, the mind or the skill, or and it'll take certain words and yeah. define them out and say it's very hard to give a direct <laughs> translation. For the Greeks, it meant any one of the following things. Does so it do this in the as you're reading as along. you're going along yeah, yeah. it's the it's the note that, okay. <clears throat> that the entire yeah yeah when, when, yeah when you think about the role of, of, of plato in the history of philosophy and in terms of metaphysics uh as the idealist philosopher who said that reality you know that reality is here and appearance is here and m much of that is uh, the, the whole history of metaphysics and Western philosophy stems uh, largely from, from a lot of what Plato has written. But I think what is interesting was that, uh, that here in the Republic, you have those, those ontological, you know, what is the meaning of existence, what really exists, what doesn't, so forth and so on. And you have that cast, though, in, in a political science uh, mode. Mm -hmm. which is, I think that's what's kind of puts us all a little bit off, and maybe that is, uh, as you say, the, the irony part of it is that he's playing with these uh, metaphysical ideas in, in, in a context of Athenian democracy at the time, which he's not comfortable with. It's not perfect. It isn't perfect, so he's postulating this other republic, which I think perhaps, I mean, we certainly don't think it's perfect, and Maybe he didn't either. Maybe this is all, as, as you say, kind of an ironical setup. But his real, the, the real message that he wants to carry through is, in, is more in philosophical terms of reality, uh, ideas, epistemology, the theory of knowledge, how do you pursue knowledge, uh, the, the, the process of the dialectic, a lot of other things. And that, that his political science is really kind of kind of weak and weird as a um, result. Well, that brings another thing to mind that I uh, had a thought about when he um, wants to not have the children learn, uh, or young men, learn about the, um, the myths and the poets, and he wants to throw out Homer and have the gods treated differently or seen differently and so on. <coughs> I think at this particular point in Greek history, there was really a big ch uh, current of uh, undercurrent of thinking going on. Of, I mean, it comes out in some of the plays, questioning mm -hmm. exactly who are these gods? Do, you know, do they really do this? Um, is this really the way it is? And I think that there was a lot more that was affected in the larger geographical area of coming and going of ideas of, and that it is something we, or at least I don't know, I, I know a, a tiny little nibble about it enough to make me curious. Um, but I think that that's part of, of why he wants to throw out Homer. The children can't hear Homer and the poets, mm -hmm. but as the introduction says, that's all they had. They didn't have as we have the Bible to, mm -hmm. as, as our kind of book. Mm -hmm. um, that was their Bible. The Iliad, the Odyssey, mm -hmm. and uh, were their Bibles. And then the plays that had the Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides that had just been in the previous 75 or so years been presented. And all the poets were, that's all they knew. And there was this mm -hmm. big period of change. Maybe that's why those poets or those playwrights, maybe that's why the plays got written at the time they did get written and were as popular as they were, it was because they dealt with all these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And then along comes Socrates and Plato, who's going to write about it, because Socrates, as far as I know, didn't write. He did not write. Yeah. Not yeah. Well, that also ties in with our reading of the Phaedo. Remember uh, um, where you start getting these glimmerings of, of, th of theological glimmerings yeah. of uh, that go far beyond. So I mean, it it, it is really. 
I mean, the, the sense that you have is Plato is thinking on a broader um, history of ideas mm -hmm. plane than, yeah, than th simply... Things are not going to be running amok so much yeah, anymore. Poseidon yeah. can't throw up the sea. Yeah. Is this really true that Poseidon... Hey. Well, so, he uses both terms. He uses the gods sometimes and God sometimes, yeah. which has got to express yeah. a transitional mm -hmm. period. Yeah, yeah. which happens in the plays, too. Yeah. Yeah. We got yeah. that in the plays. Yeah, the idea of, I mean, a monotheistic idea was sort of creeping in. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly was creeping in in the rest of the world. There's no reason mm -hmm. why it wouldn't have seeped into Greece yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, you're, I think that's a very interesting reading, and, and as far as the history of philosophy goes, maybe puts Plato closer to Nietzsche than uh, than people had supposed. Well, that's um, Greek to me, never having, <laughs> never having had philosophy. Well, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's, you know, God is dead um, uh, point oh, of departure, I, don't think he's, I guess. I don't see him he, no, 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 no that, I, that's a big leap. But yeah. the, 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 the reason I bring it up is because I do think that he is, um, that Plato is, uh, he's playing well, I would uh, fast and loose is not right, but he's playing fast and loose with, uh, with received ideas in a way I, I think that hasn't right. been done before. And mm -hmm. and you know you pointed this out. His rejection of Homer is, um, uh, it's huge. That's a big deal. That's You've got to assume that yeah, that is that, yeah, that is a scandal, totally um, and and that is uh, and and it does put a, a different spin on this, um, as a uh, and and on what he might have been trying to do with it as well. I think in light of what you just said, I think it's significant that there are so many points of view represented in, in this evening. The, the religious is there, the cynical businessman is there, and they all get to say their thing. Mm -hmm. But Socrates it's, wins. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Socrates I don't always know. wins. Um, the, uh, he doesn't win at every some, moment, yeah, but in the end. I, I, I see the thing being justified in two different ways. One is that his uh, ideas, he, these were new ideas he was throwing out. And he did not have the experience of, uh, of those attempts that had been made for a small oligarchy to rule. Although they had had an oligarchy, I guess, in the past that had been overthrown by the democracy, but it wasn't the kind of created... He, he hadn't had the Soviet Union to look at, which was probably close to this, in a way. Uh, the other thing is that it can be regarded as a critique of the system that he was living in, of the democratic system. And it seems to me that that helps to show why it's still relevant because not that we should replace mm -hmm. our democracy or any other democracy with this, but the, but the weak points are pointed out. And the, the, the inability to, I mean, what, what are you going to, how are you going to educate children? Mm -hmm. Are you going to teach children that, that solving problems through violence is an acceptable way to do it by saturating them with violent material? That's still a relevant question. And then the, the standards that are lived up to or not by politicians is relevant. How do we select the people who are, who are our leaders? That's still a relevant issue, and I don't think we've solved that entirely. <laughs> You've noticed. Entirely. <laughs> we, we haven't even solved, um, you know, do we want our politicians to do what the people say, you know, the words, yeah. follow the public mm -hmm. opinion polls, or yeah. do they want, we want them to have a mind of their own? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We haven't right. solved that yet, and Plato right. raises that, that yeah. question. Yeah. Um, just, I, I wanted to go back briefly at least to the um, question of whether or not he's trying to be ironical in this development of the city and ultimately disagree. I don't think he's attempting to be ironical, but I also don't think that he's seriously asserting that this is a city we should attempt to develop. I believe at some place he says in order to do it, you'd have to kick out everybody under eight or something like that. Um, so that gives you a hint that it might be kind of difficult to do. Oh, great. Right, yeah, sorry, you're right, kick out everybody over Oh, you over mean start eight. over eight. Start eight. Over eight. Yes. Everybody yes. else has been polluted right. by the right. change of right. right. and so on. Right. So it's obvious that it's, you know, a, he can't be serious, it almost seems, when, when you start with that premise. Um, also, he's claiming that the place will ultimately have to be led by a philosopher king who everybody has their own appetites, has their own things that drive them, and you have the, you know, the, the lower class, which is just wanting goods and so on, you have the spirited class, which is into fighting and that sort of thing. Well, you have to find an individual 
mm-hmm. who a philosopher, lover of knowledge, who the mm-hmm. reason that they run the society in a perfectly just way is simply because they so much enjoy philosophizing and they know that if the society isn't run perfectly, well then they're just not going to be able to live life the way they want because look what happened to Socrates. He got killed you know, when you had this non-perfect society from Plato's perspective. So I, I don't think we should take it as he's trying to achieve this, but it's not ironical. In reading each part, for me, it's just l- lessons about different aspects of human nature. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, what yeah. you can expect from a leader, what are ideals for a leader, what are the different parts of the human soul for everybody, not mm-hmm. just for mm-hmm. individuals in different... It would be interesting yeah. to see what we came up with if we decided to sit around this table and devise a perfect society. <laughs> <laughs> I think he I think came up with the best answer. Ourselves. Don't tr- don't no, try. Because <laughs> um, his... Uh, and I could be mixing up Aristotle and Plato here, but I believe it was Plato who, or you can have government by the few, by the many, or by one. The very best regime is an ideal one run by one. The very worst regime is a tyranny run by one. Mm-hmm. Then by the many, uh, no, by the few, you have the second best and the second worst. And democracy is both third and fourth, um, the variations <laughs> of democracy. So yeah. it's, you know, it like if you're... Chill. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. You know, it's the best that we have. Um, I think it's also interesting to re- to consider that the the way this dialogue is laid out is probably not the way these discussions really took place at the time they took place. In other words, this was not really set up as a discussion amongst five or six people in a small city in the per- a small area of the Parisis. You know, somebody just jaw dropping in for lunch and deciding to have a philosophical discussion. I'm sure that Socrates discussed all of these issues every day on the streets of Athens, and they got bandied about quite a bit. And so, therefore, it was not a closed discussion. It was spread out through many more people that were participating, allegedly, in this dialogue <laughs> by Plato. And so, it may, this, this may be the reason Socrates was brought to trial, even though it doesn't, even real, doesn't really come out in the apology <laughs> or any of those places where he's defending himself. If he was bandying all of these ideas around the streets of, of Athens, which I'm sure he was, it's no wonder he went to trial. Uh, and the, that the Athenians decided they didn't want him around anymore. And I, that's why I think it probably would have been a good idea to read The Republic before we read The Apology and those others, because you have a better understanding of what Plato was about, after, or Socrates was about, after you read this. Well, than you, you actually, from the other dialogues. You, you raise a very good point, though, and, and you raise it in that slip there at the end, that uh, you get a very good idea of what Plato is about or rather what Socrates, well, well, what is Socrates about. was about. It's a big question. It's yes, a big question course. for for um, classical scholarship. It's a big question for philosophy. Um, and, it, and it continues to be a question. Mm-hmm. And the question is, what is this Plato or is this Socrates? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly presented as if these are Socrates's, Socrates' ideas. But, uh, but Plato's the guy that we really refer to as being the great philosopher. Um, Socrates uh, died for his philosophy um, in, in at least one story of it. But um, the question is, um, is this all invented? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the idea Socrates of the... Uh, well, that, that is a, that's a question. Um, but, but certainly the question of whose method is being represented here, is it... it we, we, we refer to the Socratic method uh, of the dialogue, but is it but the evidence that we have is that it's the it's it's at least the platonic method it may also have been the socratic method but it's at least the platonic method but i i just think that it's it's worth um thinking about whether or not we take this character in plato's dialogue to be the driving force behind that dialogue is or the dialogues is socrates the person um whose ideas these are, or are they actually Plato's who is putting them into the mouthpiece uh, of Socrates? There's a, a, an interesting postcard, and I, I don't have a, a copy of it, but um, uh, an interesting postcard that uh, has a picture of Plato and Socrates with Socrates sitting down writing and Plato 
behind him, whispering into his ear, telling him what to write, um, and that, and it, and and it sort of perfectly encapsulates the question, which is, you know, who was whispering into whose ear, um, and how do, we, and how does that change how we might think about uh, this? It may not change it at all, but it, it may also raise some interesting questions. So, this is skipping around a little bit, but back to. I'll say Socrates. Um, when I read this, uh, he's talking about, and I don't have the book that you have, he's talking about justice, and it says, does not wish to seem, but rather to be. And then he talks about, uh, he will be crucified and know that one shouldn't wish to be, but to seem to be just. And I think that Socrates was just. He didn't seem to be because he lived out his philosophy to the end. It wasn't just talk, cheap talk, but he was what he believed, if, the, if you believe the story, which I like to believe. So. But if you're going to be just, you have to take action, and there's no evidence yeah. that he ever acted Who, in any way Whoever ever says you have well, he to was take... In the, he, was in, he fought in the army, yeah. To me, justice means you make rulings or you make no. decisions or you, you know, you act in some way. <laughs> but he did. He didn't he start the academy? No, Plato. 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 Socrates started. Socrates, started, Socrates, Socrates launched a lot of ideas. But he went around started. teaching. Yeah. 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 In the, in the but it his, uh, seems to me that his concept of justice was to stand Plato aside and comment him. rather than to take any action. And I'm not sure I agree belief. with that. He died for his belief. He refused to leave. I, I think that was one of the things that Plato was, was talking about in his discussion of justice. Um, Socrates did the just thing on behalf of his beliefs instead of the just thing on behalf of himself, which I think was a... Um, uh, is, a, is the description of a philosopher. Mm -hmm. That's right, but not necessarily. But in but, the Apology, he could have he could have uh, saved himself there, and he didn't. He he very specifically that, at one point. I'm not sure that that's what and, being a just person is about, though. That's what I'm saying. Yes, he lived for his ideals, whatever they were. But I'm not sure that that's is that his well, idea. Well, that's the whole. Or, what is justice? Right. We're still <laughs> dealing with it, you know. But I'm not sure that that's. That's justice, necessarily. <laughs> justice is treating, treating fairly amongst people, to me. I mean, to make sure everybody gets a fair shake. And that, that object doesn't really, that discussion doesn't come up here. So maybe the Greek mm -hmm. use of the word just uh -huh. Has a totally well, I mean, different meaning than the way we look at it today. It has more than, than just uh, and, judges. And justice and also law. comes back into it. Um, uh, not not to to stop this conversation because mm -hmm. I think it's it's a very good one. Uh, and in fact, it's it's a criticism of of the republic as a whole that it presents a certain view of justice that may not in fact be what we want no. justice to conform to. That's not ours. But uh, justice does come back into it. Mm -hmm. um, later at a later point um, when the the switch is made f back from the city to uh, the person I guess we have to That's keep reading chapter five. and Plato also makes the point that you cannot have a thing until you have the idea of the thing mm -hmm. so you cannot have judges and courts until you know what justice is which to me Socrates life told us what the idea of justice is it doesn't come to me that way Yes. Going back right. to your question about how much is Socrates is, and how much is Plato, the the this justice. struck me as being, of the things we've read, more likely to have been worked on, worked over by Plato a lot, maybe because it's so long, but it also seems to be so much more literary than the shorter, the shorter dialogue seem to be, mm -hmm. to me at least, to be closer to what I could imagine an actual conversation going on. Maybe that's Plato's artistry, but certainly this is more like a philosophical book than it is a dialogue. Okay. As, um, duty. That's I'm curious whether, have, have people here read uh, much or at all of Aristotle? I mean, I know... Nothing. Yes, it, yes, yes. It, it's, it's awful hard reading, but when you think about Aristotle coming along later and, and knowing of Plato, knowing of uh, the Platonic philosophy and so forth, uh, it's, it's really a shame that it's not more accessible to read uh, Aristotle and find out what he thought about these kind of things in a more 
There wasn't an accessible no one way. Read him because it's he's not a good writer. He's, he's a good thinker. Uh, he's, oh, he's a he's good a writer. He's, there may be no, some I mean, parts of Aristotle a, a, we should read. He wrote well, something about why. history of Athens and its democracy that the might be worth reading. Or, the poetics, exactly. Maybe, uh, he's a great psychologist, too. And his one on tragedy is very good. No, I mean, like you know, his, 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 I mean, his influence on, on, on the history of ideas is, is enormous. And it was, his, his influence on that was really, in a sense, I mean, Plato was the foil for, for Aristotle and led to the whole That's history of, of, of Western thought. Well, Aristotle and I, taught and it's the just, academy. I vote for reading from so. Aristotle. I think <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I do too. Once you read it, you'll vote against well, it. Well, it's so awful. Well, we can just read I, a little bit. I, I just wonder if there's some, some secondary source that anybody's that ever come somebody across once that wrote makes a book it. about reading Aristotle. I can't remember the name <laughs> of it now, though. Do I want to go back to justice. Uh, you want to go back to justice? Back to justice. Okay. Um... Because I, I, I came, went back and found the note in this translation. It says the Greek word translated as, uh, com is commonly translated as justice, which is the main theme of the Republic. But justice is a thoroughly unsuitable, according to certain people, a thoroughly unsuitable word to use exactly. as a translation of the Greek word. That's okay. right. Uh, has a less legal and more moral meaning than justice. It is, in fact, the most general Greek word for morality, both as a personal quality and as issuing in right action. So Lydell and Scott translates the corresponding epithet as observant of duty to God and man, righteous, and it goes on a little bit more. Justice, right action, just right, so on and so on. It's, it's, okay, it's, it's you know, it's very, it's, justice. it's sort of like it's, virtue and beauty and all well, those see, good there's ideas. There's another note on virtue <laughs> in here, and where they use it, and they say what, yeah, you know, the Greek word for virtue, we say virtue here, but it actually well, this is, this is, is, a, is a quality that has a broader meaning and brings in some other things, too. This so. all reflects the fact that, that Plato was, was, was a, uh, was a, uh, was an idealist, and he was looking for the, the ideal, the pinnacle. Whatever it is up there that is just, that is virtue, that is But the English everything. words we use in translation, <laughs> we, we take with, uh, yeah. yeah, and we, justice we, we take with our yeah, context of today right. is not necessarily really the context of, uh, of the 400 B.C. Maybe we should all be reading Alan Bloom's translation, which he, he swears is literal. Right word for word for the Greek. Well, this this says what there is say? no right word. What does he say about justice? Um, I don't know. I don't have that immediately accessible. <laughs> but that, uh, but you know, literal. Years ago, too. Maybe not as much as you. <laughs> Even without a translator's note, I, I I do believe that that meaning of justice that you just read comes out in the discussions. You can see that they're not just talking uh, yes. about oh, yeah. a narrow meaning of the word. Particularly in book one, I think. Uh, w I mean, mm. when they're talking about the just and the unjust man, I think that, uh, that, that the idea that this is not, they're not talking about law, they're not right. just talking about duty, <laughs> they're talking about, about, they're not just talking about fairness, oh, no. Totally they're talking about some stuff. sort of amalgam of these things. Yeah. Although I, I do think that notice is... Um, oh, I like that. But one, one what thing is, yeah. whatever, moral compass. Moral compass. What, whatever it is, is, is an absolute. It is, it is the pinnacle of something out there in the, in the blue sky. And that's where I think it's interesting if you contrast what, what, Arist what little I know about Aristotle, and we all know the Aristotelian mean, that everything should be at, at, at a mean. You don't go to the extremes. And here's Plato going straight to the, <laughs> yeah. the furthest. Uh, yeah. Could I just throw in something there? I think the, the going back to Thrasymachus, is that the, the fellow at the beginning, who clearly doesn't believe in anything, any standard. Uh, that you can hold up to people's conduct. Uh, and it may be in the blue sky, but Plato and Socrates are uh, uh, attempting to persuade us that there is a standard, which is an absolute standard against which human conduct yes. can be judged. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly an honorable enterprise, whether they succeeded or not. Yes. Because I believe that if without that, then we're driven back to, th then, then it is the powerful that rule. Powerful. And, and what they're saying is it doesn't matter whether the powerful may win in a given situation, they're still wrong. 
And the question is, can you say that when the powerful crush everybody around them, they're wrong? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a standard in the sky, in my view, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. It's whoever, whoever wins, whether it's in business or in the military or any uh, po politics. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, let me, since, since we're, we've, we've only read the first part, we're only discussing the first part, let me, let me ask you guys a question because it strikes me that part of the confusion here around the idea of justice, but also uh, it, more in general, is in the move that Socrates makes from uh, the individual to, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what a just individual is, and it would be difficult for me to describe one, but let me describe a just city, which is, um, after all, just a larger just individual. Um, and it comes up again and again uh, throughout, throughout the dialogue, um, this, this dichotomy between, on the one hand, a person, and on the other hand, uh, um, the state, uh, the city-state. Is that a, I mean, is it a, he clearly, he clearly finds it a useful um, uh, device um, and, and a useful distinction, but I, I think it throws, a, it, it confuses things an awful lot. Um, and, and I wonder whether or not, how other people, do, do you feel like it's, that you can make that, that, that you can make the, the leap, what is, what we can describe about the city, we, we also can say about its individual citizens? He makes a statement someplace where he... ...something else. Um, and, and I think this is where he gets away from studying an individual and looking at the whole and that that's a higher level of discourse than if you're talking about people. I think he uses in my transit things, but that's where I felt it worked, mm. because it isn't the personality now, it's the process. But tell me, see, if, we, if we find justice in the state, then if we can define it there, then it to understand it. and to work it from that direction right. instead of the other. Right. But that's not how it, that is how he presents it, but it's not necessarily how it operates in the text. Mm -hmm. he, he speaks frequently of, um, of we can see that a, uh, just as a city divided against itself, so too a person divided against right. themselves, and, and, and things like that which, which, which turn it from just um, a search for, for what justice might be into um, I, I think a real uh, well, then he gets a, analogy that he's, he draw that he's drawing up. I mean, he, well. he doesn't stop there. He, he get, you, you, you do yeah. get into more of a study of the individual when you start yes, talking uh, about the soul. Here's an interesting quotation from Erwin Ed Edmund on uh, the philosophy of Plato. It's just on the back of this. I just happened to notice. He says that, uh, according to Plato, that justice, <clears throat> justice in the individual and justice in the state are a realm of order, an earthly anagram of that unearthly, eternal order, which is the world of ideas. Um, the perfectly ordered soul, the perfectly ordered state, are temporal incarnations of eternal reason. Yep, yep. And I think that's a pretty, pretty good summary of, of, of what Plato was all about. In his mind. Is it, is it, are, have we just listened to the first Jesuit? <laughs> I think so. Is it possible that what, what he's, this business of using the city as the example, has in a way diverted everybody's attention over the centuries because from, the, from this question he starts out with? Because certainly I thought of the little bit I read before was all about the state and the political science stuff. And that's, that's not what he sets out to do. And by using this as an example, he may have, in a way, not done what he really was meaning to do. Or maybe he really was meaning to do that and I think he had a much introduced it in a different way. Than, uh -huh. I, think he was being, state. I think he was being disingenuous when he said, let's talk about the state first and then the I don't think he ever wanted to talk about the individual. But it's easier to generalize when you talk about big things. And that's what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I had a little of that, too. I caught a little of that, too. Sometimes he reminds me of uh, Columbo. <laughs> Columbo. He's very disingenuous. He's very sly. He says, oh, yes, I agree. Yes, that's 
But you know that little thing down there, what about that? You know, <laughs> he'll just pick out some little, um, and then make his point. Mm -hmm. And he's not agreeing with everybody at all. Mm -hmm. It makes him a good stylist. Right. Yeah. More easy to read and yes. more interesting to read yes. than... <laughs> yeah, but somewhat <laughs> maddening too. I mean, every now and then you you understand why they no. had him drink a little <laughs> cup of hemlock. <laughs> <laughs> um, but about this this uh, this idea of, of working from the small up to the big, um, this is an awfully long thing, and he and Socrates talks about an awful lot of of different subjects, and he is never wrong about any of them, no. <laughs> about any of them. Uh, and, and it really, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think it's interesting both in terms of the construction of the argument and also as a rhetorical strategy, uh, which, well, th those two things closely related, but, but he, he builds by such small blocks in this, and yet I disagreed with every large premise. Uh, but well, his he, assumptions are outrageous. His yeah. assumptions are outrageous. His assumptions are outrageous, and and um, and it, you know, it it just raised a big question for me about the idea of the Socratic method, about the the, the form of the dialogue, um, about building. Uh, you, you know, Plato was so opposed to the sophists who who uh, argued about nothing, for nothing, for the sake of argument, and yet this just stunk of sophistry to me. Uh, I mean, in place after place, and they sort of come up even, even in here as, as uh, bugbears to be, to be uh, warded off. But I, I just felt like, uh, you know, Socrates was so careful about picking, uh, he, he was like an ant colony building the Parthenon. Uh, he never wanted to move a rock. He only wanted to move grains of sand, and uh, and you know basically he 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 got people to agree with every grain of sand, uh, so that so that there was no point at which people could say when he reached his conclusion, well no, <laughs> because they had been saying yes 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 yes. So it made no sense to say no at the end. I think but by the time you got to the, the end, it Jesuit. was probably a no. <laughs> I mean, after you piled all this up. You got all this accretion together, and, you know, you take a look at it and you say, is this the way they really want to form a government? And you say, blah, no, that's not the way it should be. Uh, let me ask another question about the, uh, about this government, because, uh, because I wanted to ask about what folks thought, because we are talking about this government here, I guess, um, in most of the Republic. And there's this line that, you know, one of the lines that, that jumped out at me. Uh, the rulers then, I'm sorry, it's, um, it's 389C. Uh, the rulers then of the city may, if anybody, fitly lie on account of enemies or citizens for the benefit of the state. No others may have anything to do with it. But for a layman to lie to the rulers of that kind, we shall affirm to be as great a sin, nay, a greater, than it is for a patient not to tell his physician or an athlete, his trainer, the truth about his bodily condition. Uh, I thought that w the the second part of that was quite interesting. The idea that uh, that it is a great sin not to tell your doctor <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> what's going on? Um, but but also this idea, you know, this is this is again an idea that gets argued constantly uh, in our society. What is the role of of state-sponsored lying? What is the role of uh, of secret, you know, the Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, I was just reading a, an article uh, today, or n not ra rather a, a catalog entry, and you know, we get book catalogs from all of the publishers. Oxford University Press is publishing a book about uh, this guy who fought for 15 years to get John Lennon's files released from the FBI. Uh, he had originally written under the Freedom of Information Act, and they'd sent him uh, the expurgated files, and some of the expurgation was just, I mean, it made no sense that it would be for reasons of national security. So he, you know, he, he sort of went to the Supreme Court f with this to, to broaden what the Freedom of Information Act meant, um, and, uh, and, and that's what, he, and now he's written a book about it, um, you know, which may have been his, his point <laughs> uh, all along. But, um, so it's, so it's a current issue uh, in a lot of ways, you know, what have, is it not this this idea that? Well, the 
we've already learned that the uh, these guardians or whoever do have the right to lie to people, to children and stuff. It's just that individuals can't lie to them. Right. And maybe we hang on to that. You're not supposed to lie in court. It's a, sort of a big sin. Mm-hmm. I think we generally, see that. we generally presume that we're not, nobody's supposed to lie to the president, certainly as advisors or not, if they know it, know something about a situation that, that bears on it, they should they should certainly advise the president such. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we don't, you know, maybe we don't get so touchy about whether the president lies back to us after he knows what the situation is. If we had these just rulers, they wouldn't be doing that sort of thing. Uh, no, this I think that this is that's the his point. It's that the just ruler gets to lie. Yes, yes. he gets the to decide whether or not to whether or not an issue should be lied about or not. That's part of the job description. That's part of the job description. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, but you don't have right a just in. state. Right. Isn't that one of the lessons of Plato, though, that is still valid? I mean, it really is not possible to argue rationally that the president of the United States should always tell the truth. Yeah. Is it? I mean, we can't. If if we elected a president who always told the truth, we'd be making a great mistake. That's right. Isn't that true? That, does anybody yes. would disagree with that? What about okay. if we elected the a president who sometimes <laughs> 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 knows how to tell the truth about? You're talking about it in the abstract and not about particular individuals. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 Everybody admits that national interests have to be. The question is, have a bodyguard of lies, as Churchill said. It isn't the answer. The answers aren't the problems. It's the questions because there are some questions that shouldn't be asked. That's probably. But they're also. My radical stance is with all the girls if they're going to mess up would they shut up about it don't ask don't tell don't, don't be a jerk don't, don't ask don't, don't tell. go tell about it cry but about the it. fact that we accept the president's lying doesn't and for reasons of state hopefully doesn't mean that you that the individual can lie to the irs i mean if we're trying to develop an ideal yes. state we yeah. let our president lie but we don't lie to the irs I, think I don't know that our order. president would qualify as a philosopher king because <laughs> he has some real things to say about politicians. He reads, he reads being a lot of books. Liar. <laughs> so he puts he them. He down. puts them down <laughs> in the category, not up here, yeah. but down yeah. here. I think we should probably keep in mind that he's talking about the the whole book is largely about the formation of a society, and lies in that stage. Many would argue, and I imagine Plato would argue, is inevitable. Yeah. Um, I mean. You know, we, we learn our history, you know, the founding fathers and so on and so forth, and not denying there's a fair amount of truth to it, but it's created into this larger myth. Yes. And mm -hmm. every society has to have it. They, you know, it, it holds them together, it gives them purpose and so on. I think Rome's probably the best one, uh, you know, the ancient Roman civilization with right. the Romulus Remus thing. They, I, don't, I don't know all of it, but it's just clearly a blatant example of just making up a myth to help construct and can um, hold together a society and if that's what the rulers are doing either in creating the founding myths or in in some ways keeping up that image you know for us our belief that we are generally a force for justice throughout the world so everybody can pick their favorite pet case where you know we intervene somewhere and in reality all of us think it was uh, not a case of justice but we argue otherwise you know the government puts mm -hmm. it forward as something that's more noble and it's to some to some inevitable extent it's necessary the myths we live by mm -hmm. we do it in our personal lives why not oh, in sure. our civic <laughs> lives <laughs> you have to have something outside yourself personally you have to have something larger than the petty day-to-day -day stuff that goes on don't we now you sound like Shakespeare. <laughs> to take oh, stuff, you use that word. <laughs> we are the stuff that dreams are made of. Petty pace. Well, uh, it's, it's 9 o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we should break up unless you guys really want to keep, keep well, talking. What are we reading time? next time? What, yeah. More of this, I hope. Very well, um, now, I, if... I want to thoroughly recommend this version. Um, I just was looking again here in the introduction. It explains at the very beginning, the translator's introduction, of the state of Athens at the time that Plato grew up. Yeah. The wars, the Peloponnesian Wars, mm -hmm. what the government was, the changing governments, 
and by the time he was 18, what had happened? And so when he was coming into his full adulthood, Athens was on a very bad, Athens lost it at that point and was on a very bad downward spiral. And I think that that's important. And this book, besides saying what all these words mean and giving you caveats all along, I just, that's if you all have yeah. questions about, yeah, I think I got this here that with your translations, I just am finding this enormously helpful. That's the Penguin. Mm -hmm. Desmond Lee's Penguin Edition. Um, it doesn't have no. Lee's name on the outside of it, but it's... Uh, no, but it's the Penguin Classics It's Classic the Penguin edition. Classics. Um, second edition revised. Uh, we, but it's the one upstairs. <laughs> okay. I think okay. we have it, and if, and if we don't, we can certainly order it and get it by the end of the week, uh, and, and at the latest, uh, right after the weekend. So, um, now... The the division is it was actually pretty much in half. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so five through ten for next time in, inclusive. So um, it's uh, he he it's much more of the same. Um, it's um, the the forms begin to enter into it much mm -hmm. more in the later part of the book. Um, the the two um, the. The divided. Th there are two uh, allegories of of reality uh, presented by Plato. One very briefly. It's important. It's not very famous. It's called the divided line. Um, and then the other, right after the divided line, the next book begins uh, with the allegory of the cave, which is uh, the you know arguably the most famous bit of of Plato. Um, and but then he takes up in book ten again. Uh, the idea of uh, of reality and representations of reality, and he's got some uh, I, I think some startling things to say. His the the Platonic ideal comes up as something that that in itself is so important to him that he's uh, he's willing to throw uh, things like say poetry uh, out, <laughs> art <laughs> out um, in in favor of this. Uh, or, or maybe not. Yeah, I mean, you, you see what you think. That's that's kind of how it struck me. So uh, it, it is an interesting, uh, and interestingly, the city kind of tails off, um, and and the last several books do not, don't aren't very concerned with it. So what do we do for September? September. Now we'll continue our discussion about Plato's Republic with Professor Stanley Rosen of Boston University. Mr. Rosen has written 13 books, and three of them are about Plato's dialogues. This interview is about 45 minutes long. Right. Since yeah, it's the first it's so Tuesday of the month. Out. Professor Stanley Rosen, who is in Boston and teaches at Boston University, uh, any quick reaction to this idea of a book group sitting around talking about Plato's Republic? My quick reaction is that uh, it's a, an, an, a, this might sound a bit uh, uh, flowery or rhetorical, but I think it's a, a wonderful testimonial to. Uh, uh, the democracy, that people can do this kind of thing without the kind of sophisticated uh, education and background that one would see in equivalent groups in some European countries. I, I sort of was impressed by it. I mean, obviously, some of the, some of the responses were very, were very naive, but uh, many of the people who participated, I think, perceived real difficulties and, and brought up uh, interesting objections uh, to what they took to be Plato's argument. Where I think they went wrong is in taking the work too seriously. That is to say, they didn't treat it as a work of art and one in which a variety of points of view are being presented uh, in ways that are going to uh, be meaningful differently for different kinds of people. They took it as a kind of monolithic argument, you know, something like an essay on civics that they might have been assigned in high school, saying the same thing to everyone and meaning uh, everything that it says to be taken quite literally. Now, that's the wrong approach to the Platonic dialogue. I mean, uh, to read that dialogue, is you have to approach it more uh, in the way that one might approach uh, a play by Shakespeare. But with that, with that uh, said, I thought that uh, there were some very shrewd points made. I was impressed by it. Let me go over a number of questions that I asked you earlier, because people often come to this network um, at different times and may not have heard of an earlier discussion. Certainly. Uh, who was Plato? Plato was the... Uh, as I said before, the, the, the real founder of the Western European philosophical tradition in the sense that 
he was the first to write a body of work which we believe ourselves to have in its entirety and which lays out uh, the broad subject matters of uh, philosophy uh, for the first time. When did he live? He lived in the uh, fifth and fourth centuries, uh, born in 428 and died in 348 BC. So he's 2,500 years ago or so. That's right, that's right. How did we get to know him? In the first place, where did he come from? I mean, in other words, how he's is an he... Athenian. An Athenian. How did he? But how did he? His how did his words live through all these years? Much to his surprise, <laughs> Plato believed that uh, that uh, history was cyclical, and that there would be periodic destructions of the cosmos. I don't think he thought that his books would be read, you know, for more than a few hundred years. As it happens, they were preserved in the library in Alexandria, and uh, we've, we're not in touch with the complete history, you know, of the of the. Uh, uh, the manuscript tradition, and the, the study of that is a, is a specialty in itself, uh, not mine. Well, our knowledge, our direct knowledge of the text goes back to approximately the 8th century A.D., uh, the oldest manuscripts in Paris and Venice, uh, places of that sort. Uh, so we've had a continuous knowledge of Plato uh, from those manuscripts and an indirect knowledge of Plato in discussions by people who studied him exactly as... Uh, uh, as uh, my students study philosophers in the university. Do you have any idea how many students you've taught over the last 43 years? Uh, I know I've turned out about 45, 40 or so, I don't want to exaggerate, on national television, something like 40 PhDs who are now, most of them, you know, teaching and, and so on elsewhere. Hundreds and hundreds, probably close to 5,000 undergraduate students. I, I really w have lost track. Let's just say 5,000 is not an unreasonable number. If you were able to sit down with Plato today and ask him some questions, what are a couple that you'd want to ask based on all these years of thinking about what his words are all about? I would ask him, Plato, how can I know for sure that you believe what you're saying? How can I distinguish between the rhetorical parts of your dialogues and the parts that you are uh, stating for the good of the human race, things that you want us to believe so that we won't be miserable, and things that you actually understand? What did he think of religion? That would be one of the questions that I would ask him. <laughs> I'm going to give you, again, a, a short answer to a long story. I think Plato believed that there was a divine spirit visible in the cosmos. I don't think he believed in personal gods of the sort that uh, we know from Greek mythology. I think he believed that there was a difference between good and evil, that there was a force of good and a force of evil. Sounds a little bit like Star Wars, but uh, I think you find that, that kind of thinking in Plato that there is a, a, there is a kind of, of divinity in the cosmos. But I don't think Plato believed in personal immortality. I don't think he believed in personal gods. That's my own view. What do you think he would think of uh, this discussion we've been having over the last couple of years about Bill Clinton? He would have been absolutely horrified. Uh, I mean, not that, not that, not that Bill, I take it you're referring to Bill Clinton's famous peccadilloes with uh, with Miss Lewinsky. Yeah, and just this whole discussion about what is character and morality right, right. and all that. Plato would have said, this is typical of a democracy. That sounds very harsh to our ears. And uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking, as I say that, of a lady on the, uh, in the book discussion who said she thought that uh, Plato was actually defending democracy. I'm afraid that's not right. Plato is a great enemy of democracy. And one of the things that he held against democracy is that it brings forward leaders of corrupt character, that it's the nature of a democratic uh, regime that it cannot produce noble or uh, gentlemen as rulers, uh, that their, their personal characters are flawed by uh, mass media, mass markets, massive audiences, the need to appeal to the lowest common denominator, and so on. So he wouldn't have been surprised at all. He would have taken this as further evidence uh, towards the inferiority of a democracy. What would his teacher, Socrates, think about all this? Word for word. <laughs> Same thing? <laughs> Same thing, yeah. Do they agree on everything? Mm, that we don't know, because we don't know anything about Socrates in his own voice. What we know about Socrates, we know from Plato. And it's clear, uh, Plato was not interested in uh, historical accuracy. He was an artist. In other words, he w there will be anachronistic representations in the Platonic dialogues. You won't be able to say, oh yes, these events clearly mark this dialogue as having taken place in the year such and so. But more specifically to your question, uh, uh, Mr. Lamb, uh, some people tried very hard to find out what Socrates himself thought and to distinguish it from Plato.
We have a couple of other sources. One is a, a play by Aristophanes called The Clouds. And uh, there's another uh, a student of Socrates named Xenophon, who wrote a big book called The uh, Memorabilia, Memories of Socrates. And there are one or two smaller and less significant things uh, which talk about Socrates. But by and large, we have obviously nothing in Socrates' own name. And so what we think about Socrates arises largely from our comparison of the portrait of Socrates in Plato, Aristophanes, and Xenophon. Unfortunately, they, they portray Socrates at, at uh, different times in his life. And so it's not possible to, to come up with a homogeneous picture of Socrates. And it's not possible to clearly differentiate Socrates from Plato. One last point. Aristotle makes some comments. He was a student of Plato's. And he makes some comments and says Socrates was concerned, let's say, with ethical questions, whereas Plato raised uh, metaphysical questions. I would take that uh, with a grain of salt, but it gives us a slight indication, uh, namely that Socrates had less abstract, not quite so complicated theories as Plato had. That was more interested in uh, problems of everyday life and uh, ethics. I don't want to exaggerate that, but that's the implication that Aristotle gives us. I don't know whether you have this figure or not, but how many folks lived in Athens 2,500 years ago? Well, actually about 300,000. Uh, and of only 25,000 of whom were full citizens. In other words, women, of course, were not citizens. Children were not citizens. Resident aliens were not citizens. And slaves were not citizens. So when we speak of the Athenian democracy, we're actually speaking of, uh, of a very small proportion of the, uh, of the inhabitants of the country, less than 10%. How did they communicate back then? By talking constantly. <laughs> they were very vocal people. The, the Athenians, there's a Greek word, parousia, which means a kind of uh, freedom of, lib uh, not freedom in, uh, in the political sense, but you know, just talking all the time. They were very, very big talkers. And uh, they were constantly suing each other, not unlike Americans. They were always in, in the law courts. They were always arguing politics. There were constant factions and, and quarrels between uh, the rich and the poor, uh, the oligarchs, the few, the few and, the, and the many. So it was a, a, a place of, of constant conversation. Apparently the reverse of Sparta, for example, the great uh, rival to the Athenians, who were, as their name suggests, Spartan, and who didn't talk so much, but were uh, busy exercising and, uh, and obeying the laws of the gods. You're originally from Warren, Ohio, and I see on my sheet here that your father was a pharmacist. Right. Was he born in this country? No. No, he was born in, uh, in, uh, in fact, I once asked him, <laughs> he died this year at 97. I asked him, where were you born? In Poland, Lithuania, or Russia? And he shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know. <laughs> it was that part of the world that was changing, you know, from week to week. How about your mother, Celia? She was born in Russia. And she spent uh, World War I there and was chased by Cossacks to her, her, mem her really, really frightening memories of the place. My father remembers uh, Russia, let's call it, idyllically because he left before World War I, whereas my mother lived through World War I and, and starved and was persecuted for being Jewish and just uh, in general, you know, was in the midst of a very, very bad situation. Well, how does a, a young man who was born in 1929 like you in Warren, Ohio, go from immigrant parents to the University of Chicago and become a philosopher, teacher, professor? How'd that all happen? Well, that's, that's the famous glory of the United States. I mean, the opportunity here was, uh, was available. I, I don't know if I can give you a, a more specific answer. It, it's just, I can tell you this. I was deeply influenced by my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, who was an Orthodox Jew and a man who obeyed the laws as literally as was humanly possible and who got up every morning at 6 o'clock to strap on the phylacteries and the prayer shawl and to pray. And I, as a little boy of five or six, you know, would sort of wake up and he wouldn't even know I was watching him. And I would watch him do these prayers. And uh, he just impressed me tremendously. And I'm certain that he was, he was the initial influence on me, sort of turned me from the frivolous youth that my nature uh, wanted me to be to the more serious professor of philosophy that uh, love for my grandfather and, of course, for other people uh, turned me into. How many books have you written? Uh, it's hard to say because some of them have been, a couple have been revised and some have been reprinted. I guess about 13 or 14. And in general, what kind of books are they? They're books that uh, not many people would want to read. <laughs> they're, 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 they're philosophical works. My first, my first book was poetry, actually. I began as a poet. And uh, 
I published a book of poetry when I was about 21. But uh, I was uh, turned around, as they say, in the espionage world. You know, there's a, there's a Greek word, periagoge, uh, that's used in the Republic, uh, the turning around of the soul. I was turned around from poetry to philosophy by a man named Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago, uh, a man of some notoriety today among uh, uh, people who are interested in politics. And uh, he had a lot to do with that. I, before I met him, I thought that poetry was philosophy. I thought there was no difference between the two except in the idiom of the languages. But uh, this man uh, played a major role in, in convincing me otherwise. Uh, is that an answer to your question? Yeah, I, I wanted to, what I was really trying to <clears throat> get to was uh, when was that moment? I mean, you know, a lot of us went through college and philosophy mm -hmm. was a struggle and trying to understand how it all fit in was I a see struggle. What you mean. I'm sorry. And at what point did it yeah. trick you, trip you in and say, boy, I love this stuff? Right. Uh, the honest answer is that I literally have been this way ever since I was a, a child. I don't mean by that sitting around and studying Plato, but all my life. Uh, I've been fascinated by, uh, from the time I was a little child, the motivations of human beings, why we're here, where did the universe come from, that kind of thing. I'm sure there must be lots of kids who have those, those notions. But they were always with me. In other words, it's not the case, in my, in my case, it's not the case that uh, I always wanted to be an engineer or a, professor, a, a, a lawyer or something and got to college, took a good course, and then said, gee, this is for me. To the contrary, I assumed somewhat pretentiously, that I was a philosopher before I got to college. And I thought that I was expressing my philosophy and my poetry. And it was only when I got to the University of Chicago that I, I was, it was explained to me how ignorant I was and how much work was involved in transforming myself into a disciplined thinker. And I've never finished that task. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily difficult one. Let's go back to the discussion held at uh, Politics and Prose Bookstore. And for us at C-SPAN, it's a a little bit of uh, an experiment because this whole program from start to finish has been produced and scripted and not scripted because the discussion was uh, was uh, uh, informal and with no script but it's been put together by Richard Hall he, he was the photographer and the producer and brought us uh, Professor Rosen among other things uh, when we go back to l looking at these discussions that were held in June and July uh, do you ever do that kind of thing in your classroom where you have your students sit around and try to work through all this? Uh, yes, yes. But you can't do that in a class of 185 people. In other words, that kind of thing uh, requires a limited, a limited number of people. Uh, I, I, for many years, in fact, taught by taking a text, let's say a short dialogue by Plato, with 15 students seated, seated around the table. And then we would start in the old Talmudic way with the title, and uh, I would raise the question, why is the, why, let's say the dialogue is called Phaedrus. Phaedrus is the name of a, a man in the, who is a character in the dialogue. Well, if Plato called the dialogue the Phaedrus, he must have had some reason for it. Can we figure out what that is? And then we would go on from the, from the title to the first sentence and so on through the dialogue. If there were 10 or 15 uh, good students in the class, then we could have a kind of round table discussion. Uh, so I did follow that form to a certain extent. But you know, in a classroom, there comes a point where the instructor must know more than the students, otherwise uh, he's cheating them. <laughs> At a certain point, it's necessary for the instructor to talk. And so you can't have just a continuous exchange of fragmentary views, which are entirely appropriate in something like a great books club discussion. The, um, the uh, three people you mentioned earlier, and we talked a little bit about this uh, in the setup for the discussion, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Yeah. Um, Socrates, you said, was killed at age 71, and Plato was his student. At right. what time in Plato's life was he a student? Oh, roughly speaking, in his early manhood, you know, 20 to 40, something like that. And when was Aristotle Plato's student? Uh, Aristotle spent 18 years studying with Plato. I can't give you the exact dates now, but it was after Plato was already a rather mature man, long after Socrates' death. And Plato had already established the, uh, what we would call the university, his academy. Aristotle, as it were, enrolled as a student there. The, the word academy, is that something that was created, that word created by uh, Plato? Well, it's, it refers to a, an area in uh, Athens. It's just a geographical area. But is that what we mean today when we talk about the academy? Yeah, when we talk about the academy, we're referring back to the first academy, the first university. What? I went back there, by the way, Brian, uh, 
1956 when my wife and I were living in Greece and it was a garbage dump and there were goats chewing on tin cans and uh, it made such a terrible impression on me that I wrote a poem which turned out to be my last poem so that's 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 the correct uh, uh, inference on your part we speak of the Academy in honor of the first university did any of those three men Socrates Plato or Aristotle hold office of any kind ever no I mean Socrates served in the army he refused to participate in politics uh, Plato started his what can you call it he had a brief period in which he was associated with uh, a political regime but I, I don't believe he ever held office he dropped out very soon he was disgusted by uh, the character of the uh, politicians uh, not just in Athens but in general you could you could say he was disgusted by the kinds of compromises the lying the cheating the rhetoric the self-interest that one had to engage in in order to be successful politically and he saw no no point to it and he also was familiar of course with uh, the fate of Socrates and uh, felt that any decent man who entered into the political life and tried actually to resolve or to contribute to the resolution of the human problem would die would be put to death so he did not hold any office similarly with Aristotle is there a difference um, in the philosophy of Aristotle and Plato well that's uh, yes I mean the, the short answer is yes Aristotle spent uh, his life arguing with his great teacher Plato and he made certain radical changes in uh, some of the fundamental ideas contained in the platonic dialogues uh, I don't know if you want me to go into them in any detail now but he did make certain changes he is he was also uh, less daring and and uh, adventurous in, in writing on political affairs there's nothing like Plato's Republic in Aristotle's uh, corpus even though he might agree with Plato you know on a lot of things he presents a more moderate measured view of uh, the political life and he talks about ethics uh, in a way that is accessible to uh, the gentleman the Greek gentleman whereas Plato tends to speak uh, in his dialogues in more extreme terms and we also uh, uh, you know think of Plato as uh, the, the father of the, the doctrine of ideas uh, we could by a, a philologically incorrect step but nevertheless one that makes sense intellectually we could say that Plato idealizes presents us with ideals of human behavior but which uh, are so exalted people like Socrates for example that the average person even the average decent person could not live up to that standard Aristotle looks more closely at human beings as they are still presents us with a kind of paradigm of how to behave but the paradigm is one that's within reach <laughs> perhaps that's a good way to put the difference you know as I listen to you talk about uh, the things that they were all interested in <clears throat> especially Plato um, if you if you've read the Fellows papers and especially the Madison work you can see reference to things like interests and uh, and and all the things that have have survived all these years how yeah. much impact did those writings 25 2300 years ago have on people like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton and the and the forefathers here well to answer as simply as possible I think the notion of the gentleman of the educated gentleman uh, goes back to Plato and Aristotle whether they got it from Plato or from Aristotle or even from Cicero the Roman Roman philosopher that would vary from case to case to a certain extent the picture that the the authors of the Federalist Papers had of the gentleman the landed aristocrat the man who has enough property so as to have sufficient leisure to acquire the kind of education that will qualify him to be a responsible statesman that goes back also to the uh, English aristocracy they, you know they were influenced by people like John Locke and uh, Montesquieu and so on but there's the uh, the English writers in turn were influenced by the Greeks so one can answer your question very generally by saying that the paradigm that one finds the model that one finds in the Federalist Papers of it being better to be ruled by gentlemen well educated who have some money and property and therefore responsibility and stability and who with the with this money can have leisure to be well educated and thereby to discharge their political duties in a way that all of us will benefit from that's essentially Platonist in its in its notion that was taken for granted by the Greeks if you're going to rule you must have virtue if you're going to be virtuous you must have been habituated to be virtuous in order to be habituated to be virtuous you have to spend your life doing virtuous deeds and in order to do that you have to have money so that's the unfortunate unfortunate root of that where was the Bible 
when back in those days, I know it's an obvious, uh, uh, I mean, it's probably an obvious answer, but, but at what point when they were alive, uh, how far were we away from having the King James Version of the Bible? Are you referring now to the, uh, the, the founding fathers of the American? No, I'm referring to the, oh, oh, the oh. you know, the yeah, yeah, Plato, Aristotle. Well, well uh, uh, you know, there's a legend, and I, I want to emphasize that this is just a legend. 18th century German historians of philosophy, some of them took it seriously, that Plato went to uh, Israel in his travels. There was a period in his life when he traveled. He went to Egypt, for example. It was when he tried, I remember I mentioned he started out in politics as a young man of about 20. Then when he became disillusioned with that, he withdrew from government, left Athens, and traveled. And one of the places he went to was Egypt. And you will find stories in 18th century German textbooks saying that Plato studied with Moses, <laughs> and that that's why he was so wise. But there's no connection. I mean, the connection between the Jews and the, 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 uh, the biblical tradition, and the, uh, between the Greeks and the Bible, comes with the, with the New Testament. Uh, it's, there, there's no connection, as far as I know, between the, the Hebrew Testament and the, and the Greeks. There's some, you know, everybody's got theories about everything. But uh, I think I've given you the general consensus. Greek, Greek philosophy, uh, St. Paul was already influenced by some of the later Greek thinkers. You'll find elements of Greek thought in the, in the Christian Bible. But the Hebrew Bible uh, is quite independent. You told us earlier that Plato did not like democracy. That's right. What then would he think of this country based on what you've read over the years? He would be very harsh with us. I mean, obviously, that's a misleading way for me to answer the question because it implies that Plato would, if he were alive today, would judge 20th century America by standards of 5th century Athens. Plato would make two kinds of judgments, if I may dare to speak for him. The first kind of judgment would be to compare the United States with its contemporaries. In other words, to say, well, the United States has certain faults, but if we compare it with uh, certain countries which will be unnamed, it looks pretty good. On the other hand, if you were to, if, if the second way in which Plato would judge the United States would be as a democracy gone wild, and a, a country in which uh, virtue has been replaced or radically modified by the desire for comfort. Incidentally, that's a point that should be made. It goes back to the founding fathers of, of this country and to the, the beginning of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. Whereas the Greeks believed that only the good life was worth living, right? Good in the sense of virtuous. The founders of modernity, and the late modern period in particular, but, well, the middle modern period, the 18th century, of which our founding fathers are a part, believed that it wasn't enough to live a good life. You also had to live a comfortable life, or to put that in a slightly different way, people who were invoked to live a good life would not be able to reach that high, and however, highly, however high they could reach would depend upon how comfortable they were, so that uh, they were much more practical, and they modified the idea of, of uh, virtue by comfortable. So Plato would condemn that. Let me, let me try to go to what we know of today in, in world affairs and ask you whether or not this is virtuous. Would Plato think it's virtuous for the United States to go after Saddam Hussein to protect Kuwait, or would he think it's virtuous for us to bomb over in uh, Belgrade in that area to yeah. protect the Kosovars? That, look, I, I, that's a very difficult question. I, I'm going to answer it. The in principle is not difficult to answer. Plato was very tough. The Greeks were very tough. They had no hesitation whatsoever about killing their enemies. They had no hesitation at all about that. But the particular case of what to do with the Yugoslavians, for instance, would be for Aristotle a question of prudence. I mean by that that the wisest men of the most mature experience would have to spend a considerable amount of time weighing the alternatives with it by what criteria? Well, with respect to the, on the one hand, the, the interest of the United States, the national interest of the United States, and on the other hand, the principles of moral justice. Now, that's exactly what we were told was going on, right? I mean, I, I know only what I see on television. And I was told uh, by statesmen and by reporters that there was an agonizing appraisal of this whole Yugoslavian business uh, precisely in those terms. If that's correct, if that's what was actually happening, then that was very much in the spirit of Aristotle, let us say, and uh, by extension of Plato as well. So for every particular political event, one has to be guided not by some abstract principle, of virtue. One has to be guided by the knowledge that the good can never be fully implemented, that actual life is so complicated, 
that you will go wrong if you try to force a good principle onto all aspects of the problem and that you have to simply take the problem apart and try your best to decide the consequences of a variety of actions. So my answer to you is that I can't say what their particular opinion would have been of American policy with respect to the Yugoslavians, but the procedures that we were at least told were being invoked to arrive at that decision, those would have been exactly the procedures that, that people like Plato and Aristotle would have recommended. There would have been, if I may add one more thing, there would not have been on their part any kind of humanitarian sentimentality about killing innocent people. They were very tough. I don't mean that they were vicious, but they knew that uh, when you go to war, you kill people. And if you're trying to survive, uh, in, in the long run, it's less humanitarian to worry about casualties. Something that would have been unintelligible to Plato and Aristotle is what I see so frequently on TV these days, namely men in, 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 in uniforms, military men, generals, saying, we mustn't put our troops in harm's way. That would be unintelligible to Plato. Warriors are supposed to die for the country. You know, I, I don't mean to sound bloodthirsty to your audience, but you asked me a question uh, to which this is a very, very appropriate reply. That would be unintelligible to them. So that kind of consideration, namely, we mustn't hurt innocent people, that wouldn't be number one on their list. Not because they liked to hurt innocent people, but because if you're not prepared to hurt innocent people, then you run the risk of being destroyed yourself. If you've just joined us, we're talking about Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. Why here on C-SPAN are we doing this? Because this is an attempt at uh, showing you what a classic book group discussion looks like at Politics and Prose Bookstore here in Washington, an independent bookstore. And we videotaped through the direction of Richard Hall two 90-minute discussions held in Ju June and July of this year, 1999. And our guest, Stanley Rosen, is in Boston, and he's helping us try to figure all this out. He's been teaching for 43 years, five years at Boston University, and uh, 38 years before that at Penn State. And he, as we said earlier, was graduated from the University of Chicago with a bachelor's and a PhD back in 1955. What was your PhD thesis on? It was on Spinoza's political philosophy. Why did you pick that? Because my professor instructed me to do so. <laughs> he was not a permissive man. I mean, today when students come to see me who want to write a doctoral dissertation with me, they tell me, I want to write on so-and-so. And I either agree or don't agree. But the man I studied with uh, saw things quite differently, and he assigned topics uh, to his students. And is that Leo Strauss? That's right. And, and why does everybody rave about Leo Strauss? Why do they rave about him? Yeah, we, you know, we hear a lot of it here when we talk to people like you. Well, uh, I can tell you why I would uh, rave about him. He was the greatest teacher that I ever had. He was a man of extraordinary erudition, wide-ranging knowledge of Hebrew, Arabic, Greek, Latin, the Romance languages. He was especially good in the history of political philosophy, but he, he knew more than that. But he, he largely wrote about that because he was a professor of political science. He was a man who saw clearly, I think, the weaknesses of late modernity You'll find uh, in Strauss, in uh, not quite so excitable prose style, lots of criticisms of modernity that you find in writers like Nietzsche, or which uh, uh, you would even find in, in people on the left, like uh, uh, the Frankfurt School. Uh, a very common uh, uh, objection to Strauss, some people raved about him positively, others raved about him negatively. The people who raved about him negatively, who hated him, were uh, self-styled liberals who felt that Strauss was himself a conservative and a reactionary. Strauss criticized modernity in particular because he believed that relativism, the decline of the moral tradition of the West, loss of belief in the values of the, of the uh, aristocratic culture of Western Europe, uh, all of these things were declining and deteriorating. And uh, he was himself a liberal man in the true sense of the word. He believed in freedom and he, he was a great lover of the United States and he, w he was anything but a fascist and a, and a right-winger, as he sometimes presented to be, caricature of a right-winger. I know these are tricky questions uh, when it comes to politics today versus uh, other days, but let's just say, t based on what we think a liberal is today and based on what we think a conservative is, yeah. who would be a conservative's favorite philosopher today and who would be a liberal's favorite philosopher? Well, the liberal's favorite philosopher, as far as I know, remains John Rawls from Harvard University. Uh, you mean of contemporary philosophy? No, I'm sorry. I mean I of the old-timers. Oh, I beg your pardon. 
uh, of the old timers, the great liberal philosopher, probably John Locke comes to mind almost immediately. Figures of the Enlightenment, you know, Locke. In the United States, we think, I think we still think very highly of John Dewey. He's not read quite as much as he was 50 years ago. But of the great classical figures, uh, perhaps John Locke of the political thinkers. So a liberal would run out to a bookstore and say, give me John Locke. I want to read what well, I think. He might, he might. Well, you know, that, that, uh, I'd have to come closer to the 20th century if you, if you put the question in that way. Well, let, let, me, then, well, let me just go, because <clears throat> I want to get back to Plato, but let me go to the, the conservative side. What would be uh, the, their choice? Edmund Burke, the English uh, political writer of the 18th century, very high on the list of uh, conservative favorites. Edmund Burke. And uh, Aristotle uh, ranks high because of his moderation and uh, prudence. Uh, there are still some Thomists, but I don't think Thomas is read again as much as he was 50 years ago. I would, I would restrict myself to uh, Aristotle and Edmund Burke. Okay, who's yours? My favorite philosopher? Yes, sir. Plato. And how do you define him politically? You say he's not for democracy. Does that make you not for democracy? Well, I mean, but don't forget that the word democracy means the rule of the mob. That's another thing that has to be brought out. Plato, Plato uh, one can admire Plato without sharing his political views. One can even share Plato's political principles and see that in order to enact them under real circumstances of the 20th century, one has to be a Democrat. If Plato were alive today, I think he would be uh, on the side of, of the West, in other words, the Western European democracies. I, I don't want to say he would be an American. That's a little too self-serving. But if he were an American, yeah. where would he fit into our political spectrum, or could he? It, it wouldn't be possible to put him into one, one place or another. The conservatives would like to claim him for themselves. He would, he would, be, he would look like a, uh, uh, I would say he would look like a, a, a liberal conservative. You remember Eisenhower used to call himself that? A liberal conservative, a uh, little bit left, a little bit right of center. Plato would certainly be in favor of strong education. He would be in favor of uh, high standards, high moral standards in political office. He would have had zero toleration for Clinton's hijinks. He would have been very much opposed to the large sums of money that have been collected by George W. Bush, or for that matter, Al Gore or Bill Bradley. He would have spoken in a voice of moderation against the excessive rhetoric, the empty-headed lying that goes on on television by candidates, the uh, uh, failure to articulate programs that they themselves know are reasonable or have a chance to pass, kowtowing for the sake of uh, election. Uh, but uh, most reasonable people would say, would say that. In other words, I think Plato would have been a man of reason. If I may honor my views with that, uh, with that title. All right, based on uh, the discussion that we watched and yeah. Listening to you tell us about Plato. If someone is, is, has been uh, eavesdropping on this conversation, that's what they're supposed to do. Right. What would you recommend they do? We're talking about people that have not studied much philosophy. They sure. may or may not have a college degree. Right. Uh, they feel a little bit, um, you know, underprepared. What book or books would you recommend that they go by to start the process of learning all about this? About Plato? Yeah. Uh, of course. I think they could do uh, much worse than to start with the Republic, but the Republic is, a, a, as you, a, the Republic is, is hard to start with, not because it isn't a, a wonderfully written and exciting book, but because uh, it sets people off. The harshness and peculiarity of the details of Plato's political program uh, tend to alienate uh, 20th century readers. I think myself that uh, the best way to start with Plato is to read dialogues like the Symposium, and the Phaedrus, which are human documents. The Symposium, I happen to have written a book about it. Maybe that's why it's a favorite of mine. Is your book available? Yes, it is. Yes. And can people go online or go to a bookstore and say, I want yes. everything Stanley Rosen wrote? And, and I wish they would immediately. <laughs> how, how many of those books are in print? Uh, all but two or three, and they're, all but two or three, and those are coming back into print. So virtually all of my books are in print. And who publishes your books? Uh, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, Rutledge, and an outfit called the St. Augustine Press, which is now bringing back into print those of my books which, which were out of print. I have a small one here that says Plato's 
statesman, the web of politics by right. Stanley Rosen. When did you do that one? I published that in approximately 1995, if memory serves. Still fe uh, fresh? Is it useful to a beginner? Fresh as a daisy. No, you know, uh, the beginner would do better if, if they're kind enough to, to look at my books. They would do better to, to start with my book on the symposium. That would, be, that would be what I would recommend. What was the symposium? The symposium is about uh, a group of men who are at a banquet, and they decide not to get drunk, which is what people usually do at banquets, at, drink, at drinking banquets. And they want to talk instead, and they decide to talk about love. And a number of different speeches, say a half dozen speeches, are presented about love by a half dozen different kinds of people, the last of whom, or the second last of whom, is Socrates. And Socrates there gives an account of his interpretation of love and talks about his teacher, uh, a, a mythical character named uh, Diotima, a woman prophetess. And then Socrates is himself exposed by the drunken Alcibiades, uh, an actual historical character uh, who, who had some dealings with Socrates. It's a wonderful, extraordinarily rich document, you could say from the contemporary standpoint of the, the psychology of the human being, and a marvelous, beautiful, subtle document about the various types of love. I would really recommend uh, that dialogue, the symposium. How long is it? The dialogue is not very long. You know, it's about 100 pages, 80 to, 80 to 100 pages. Do any of us talk like that today? Do you, could you find a symposium going on like this anywhere in this country now? Uh, you mean of, of the sort that was held in Plato's symposium? Yes. Only in, uh, gee, I don't really know how to answer that. I, 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 I would say uh, largely uh, in uh, professional associations like book clubs or, uh, you know, there, are, there must be uh, uh, clubs. For example, I once le lectured in uh, Dublin, in Ireland, to the Metaphysical Association, and there were 500 people at my lecture, None of, very few of whom were professors. I mean, they were just citizens of the city of Dublin. And I assumed that they gathered together and uh, debated questions, you know, of this sort. But probably there's not too much of this sort of thing outside the uh, academic world. Let me ask you a couple of questions, and we'll let you go, because you've been very helpful and generous to your time. Uh, have you tried to be a great teacher? Can one try to no. be? No. Have you tried to be a great teacher? Consciously, for 43 years, do you, do you try to be a, and I don't need to use the word great, a good teacher? I mean, and if you have, no. what do you think goes into that? I love teaching. I'll put it that way. It's, a, it's a, something that comes natural to me. I don't mean pontificating or, you know, just telling people my views, but I love discussing fundamental questions with a room full of lively kids to whom the discussion really means something. If you don't love the subject, you can't be a good teacher. That, that's, that's just out of the question. Secondly, you have to be spontaneous. You have to be able to speak. Obviously, there are times when you want to give learned papers. There are times when you want to give formal lectures. But you must be able to speak spontaneously. You must have a wide experience of the different kinds of human beings. You can't utter 40 different speeches simultaneously to the 40 different kinds of people in the room. But you have to figure out a way of going back and forth in your modes of presentation so as to weave into the discussion as many of the different types of people as possible. These are some of the elements that go into being a good teacher. And finally, if I may say so, at the risk of sounding like a, an elitist swine, you have to be smart and you have to be competent. But the first things that I mentioned are really essential. Now, let me go back to that first question. Have you tried to be a great teacher? I've tried my damnedest. <laughs> yes, I've tried. And so when is it the most rewarding for you from a student? What do they say to you that makes you feel like this has all worked? Again, two different things. I, perhaps the, the most important thing to me is when I'm, I'm walking down the street or even at home and I get a, a letter or, or an email or somebody says to me, you don't know me but I studied with you 20 years ago as an undergraduate. And, and may I say this? And your course was the best thing that I ever had in college. That really makes me happy. That makes me ecstatically happy. The other experience, of course, is when a graduate student does very well. But that's somehow, you know, that's wonderful and it's a great honor, but it's not quite as immediately gratifying as having this kid, someone whom you knew as a kid, and you don't, you don't even know who he is now, just step out of the, out of the crowd, to use a metaphor and say, I had your course 20 years ago, and I still remember it. That means a great deal to me. Before we let you go, do you, are you married and do you have children? I am married and I have three children. Any of them philosophers? No. Only one of them majored in philosophy, and he's now uh, working in a, 
health food store in Montana. He went out there to, to work on the environment and found that there were no jobs. There's an environment, and there are a lot of people who are interested in it, but there's no way to support yourself. What do the other two kids do? Uh, the oldest boy is a, an examiner in the patent office in Washington. Interesting position. And my daughter uh, was preparing to be a musician, but uh, for various reasons decided not to continue and is now retooling, as they say. What does your wife do? My wife was a classicist and uh, uh, taught for a number of years. She taught Greek, Latin, French, and English at, at Penn State University. But when we began to have children, uh, she stopped that. I love what your bio sheet says here. Uh, Stanley Rosen speaks French fairly well, Italian badly, and German. He reads Spanish, Greek, and Latin. I don't know if the, those are the way, is that the way you characterize it, but is that pretty accurate? Well, more or less, you know, I have, a, I have a smattering of those things. I'm not a philologist, but I use them as scholarly tools. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, were they family men? Uh, no. Socrates, what? Socrates is the exception that proves the rule. Socrates was married and had children, but his wife was famous for being a shrew and for nagging him, and he was never at home. He was, as we say today, always out with the boys. <laughs> he was always out talking with his philosophical friends. There's a wonderful scene, either sad or funny, depending upon your own way of looking at things, in a dialogue called the Phaedo, which is about Socrates' death, his last day of life. He's taken the hemlock, and the poison is moving up his body, you know, and he's talking to his friends about uh, the immortality of the soul. And his, 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 his wife, Xanthippe, is there, and she starts crying. And Socrates says to someone else, let someone take her home. Those are Socrates' last words in the presence of his wife. So that'll tell you a little something. Plato was, as far as we know, a bachelor. Uh, Aristotle, I frankly don't even know. But they, were, uh, they, would not, they would not be what you call family men. Nietzsche has a wonderful expression, which I will cite in fear and trepidation, since the interview is almost over. Nietzsche says a married philosopher is a contradiction in terms. And I won't give a detailed commentary on that statement. Where, 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 when did Nietzsche live? Uh, second half of the 19th century, 1845 to 1900. And where was he from? Uh, Nietzsche was a German, a German, Friedrich Nietzsche. In Boston, Professor Stanley Rosen has been our helper here, among other things, to try to figure out all this. Thank you very much, sir, for coming in and, and uh, explaining to us philosophy and Plato and Aristotle and all the rest. Thank you so much for asking me. I hope it, hope it wasn't too tedious. Stanley Rosen has written about 14 books on Plato, Nietzsche, and other philosophers. If you'd like to know more about his works, contact the author by email, srosen at bu.edu.